This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. <laughs> Just like that. Um, so, uh, Majin Mai, everyone, um, and welcome to what is now our eighth meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, I just would like to advise members, as always, that they should declare any interests relevant to today's proceedings. Um, also, that you are welcome to use your mobile devices as long as they are in airplane mode and all devices are muted. Um, it's not permitted to take photographs or record any of the meeting. Um, and just to remind members that F4 on your uh, tablet will mute them and um, the meeting will be recorded on video and it will be broadcast live and the video of the meeting will then be made available on the assembly website so this morning um, the committee is going to hear from the department on the development of the new energy strategy and an overview of project stratum and then we will move into closed session to hear from the renewable heat association um, so moving on then to item one on the agenda, um, apologies this morning we have the long-standing apology from, from Stuart uh, and we also have apologies from Claire subbed in this morning. Um, and I, don't I think, think we expect Christopher later on, he is, he's been cited. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so moving on then to item number two, the draft minutes, um, it is at page uh, five of your pack. Are members content that these are an accurate record of the meeting? Content. Yeah. Agreed. Okay, so moving on then to item number three, chairperson's business. Um, there is correspondence in your packs at page 11 from the minister regarding the decision um, by Slay B to file for insolvency. Um, the minister highlights the impact of this on the company's employees, passengers and the, the uh, air connectivity um, for here in the north. So um, last week... Also, members will be aware that um, I received a briefing on Thursday afternoon from de department officials um, and also um, have spoke to the minister over the course of, all of Thursday and Friday. Um, this afternoon, um, I have a meeting with, with Brian Ambrose to, to discuss um, the, the impact and, and the potential for um, uh, other providers to be, to be taken on. So, um, Unless members have any actions that they want to suggest, um, we will provide a wee update after that, that meeting. Yeah, sure. We, we pop out a note this afternoon um, on, on what Mr Ambrose has said and, and in terms of any updates. I know some of the routes have already been picked up. Mm -hmm. I know others are hopefully going to be picked up if leasing aircraft can be found. It looks like I think most of the Scottish routes hopefully will be covered. Um, there are some routes already in the northeast of England look like they're covered as well. So it, it has started to pick up, but hopefully Brian Ambrose will have more to say. And should, you... uh, should we write a letter from, from this committee um, to the Treasury in relation to APD, yeah. just on the basis of, of the collapse of, of mm -hmm. Flyby? Yeah, I think that, yeah. that's... Um, just and on record. There is also um, when the, the bailout for Flyby was being discussed in January, um, there were two reviews to be carried out, one on APD mm -hmm. by the, the Treasury and one on um, regional air connectivity by DFT. So I, I think it would do no harm also writing to, to, to that department. Sure. Yeah. Uh, content, I think that's the right thing to do, but also I think we need to flag up that it shouldn't be an impact on the block run. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, moving on Chair, then. just on Brian, that. Yeah, we wish you well with the, the meeting with Brian Ambrose. And I think the issue of the staff, yeah. the impact on staff, you know, the ground staff and those associated with the airport, I think it'd be important maybe, you, you know, lobby somewhat on their behalf yeah. and yet some clarification on that. We have had correspondence from some of the yeah, unions think, on the issue. Yeah, so I think um, some Unite is yeah. coming up to, to Stormont this afternoon um, at 2 o'clock if yeah. members are available. Yeah. But just to make the point and, and uh, wish him well in his efforts to try and find alternative operators, but uh, just make the point about absolutely about the staff and, and their welfare and uh, you know the future for them. I think it's important that they are included, <coughs> included in your absolutely. discussions. Thank you. Thanks, to Gordon. Moving on then to, to 3.2, there's correspondence from Queen's University on page 13 of, of your pack, inviting the committee to sponsor the 2020 Queen's University Vice Chancellor's Research Prizes, the event recognising rewards um, research excellence at the university. So if the committee is um, content to reply to the university, thank them for that invitation and confirm that, that we will um, sponsor that, and then committee staff will liaise with Queen's to make the necessary arrangements. 
members here. are content? The ticket will be based here, yeah. Yes, um, mm -hmm. I think they probably will look for the Long Gallery. Um, they've done a number of events there before and they've always worked very well, so that's what we we'll aim for. Right, thank you. <coughs> Um, item 3.3, there is correspondence from the um, from FinTech Northern Ireland on page 14 of your packs asking to brief the committee to outline the role of the FinTech um, envoy. Um, obviously financial technology is a fast growing industry here and um, the UK government has ap appointed um, FinTech envoys um, across the, the UK to collaborate with the sector um, including here in the north and um, the various other regions to harness potential in, in fintech. Um, so if members are content, we would schedule a briefing from the fintech envoy in our forward work pro programme. Great. Yes. There is also a number of events in uh, the week, the 20th to the 24th of April, which is fintech week, so we'll keep members... Um, just the week after Easter. Uh, ...informed of those. Um, so moving on then to, to item 3.4, so members like myself will be very concerned by the potential impact and including the financial impact of coronavirus, that this will obviously have a particular impact on those in precarious work or zero hour contracts and, and um, lots of micro and small businesses around the, the advice, for example, to self-isolate. Um, and I think that it obviously is something that's going to be included in the... the uh, British Chancellor's mm -hmm. budget this afternoon, um, and some of uh, what is likely to be included is kind of being um, mooted this morning. So I think it will be useful for members to keep a very close eye to what's coming out of that, um, and to, to look at that with the potential of maybe taking further action uh, if, the, if we feel that the measures perhaps don't go far enough, that, that we would bring um, possibly a, a motion to the yeah. floor of the Assembly um, to give members the opportunity to discuss uh, how we might feel it should be uh, taken forward. Chair, if it's helpful, um, I've taken the, the opportunity to have a quick word with the business office and I think if we can get something potentially decided by correspondence by the end of the week, they might be able to... Scheduling is usually about two weeks, so if you if you get it on a Monday, it's, it's two weeks after, but depending on what the agenda looks like, we might be able to squeeze in a bit before that. So if, as you say, um, there are a number of issues members want to raise, that would be a good opportunity to do it, and we can try and get something done fairly quickly. So we'll, we'll keep in contact, and um, we, we'll talk about whether uh, we want to go forward with the motion, and then whatever wording, we can, we can put it by correspondence. Yeah. The members can tell us that yeah. approach? Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, moving on then to, to 3.5, uh, members are also likely aware that um, some of the universities in the south ha have moved to partial closures or uh, full closures of, the, of their campuses um, in terms of dealing with the, the coronavirus outbreak um, and if they are alongside that um, announcing plans for kind of online learning uh, options for, for students. So members are content, we would write to um, our universities and colleges asking them about their contingency plans um, and how they, they, they might work uh, as this develops. We would also want to write to both the, the trade unions and the students unions to hear their views and concerns about the potential for campus closures or, or other actions that might be taken. So would members be content for, for the, us to do that? Thank yes. you. Okay. So, so then, Moving on to item number four, it's our, our briefing from the um, Department on the Energy Strategy. Um, the committee is due to hold an energy stakeholder event on the, the 29th of April, which will be an opportunity for members to agree a list of invite in, and there will sorry, be an opportunity for members to agree a list of invitees and the format for the event after today's <coughs> Um, so there is a memo from the clerk on page 17 of your pack, and there is a briefing paper at page 6 of your table papers. So I'd like to, to welcome to the meeting today um, Richard Rogers, who's Head of Energy, um, Thomas Byrne, who's Head of Energy Strategy, and Mia Cormican, who is from Energy Division. Um, so welcome to our meeting, and if you want to give us a wee bit of a briefing, and then we'll open up to members. Thank you, Kiva. Um, the, um, just a quick introduction to ourselves. Um, I've talked with the committee before. Um, I've worked for uh, 25 years in the private sector in the gas industry and also in the fuel, fuel poverty industry. And uh, for the past six years, I've been working in government. And I'm, as, as the chair said, I'm currently head of energy group in the department. 
Thanks, Richard. Uh, my name is Thomas Byrne. Um, I have over 15 years' experience in economic development, mostly as an economist, doing research, analysis, and modelling to make sure that policies are based on, on solid evidence. Um, the past year and a half, I've been working in energy, uh, renewable electricity, and energy efficiency, and more recently on energy strategy. Hi, good morning. My name is Maeve Cormick, and I've been working with the Department on Energy Strategy since uh, last July, and I've been working in the energy sector more generally since um, 2011, primarily in the renewable electricity sector. Thank you. Um, by way of introduction, um, we, we've provided a briefing paper to the committee. Um, obviously, uh, we have a desperate need for a new energy strategy that looks ahead over the next 30 years for providing a pathway to net zero carbon, and it's in line with the commitments in the new decade, new approach. Um, the strategic energy framework uh, was established in 2010, and it has now passed its useful sell-by date, but it's worth emphasising that the, there were two targets there. One was 10%, not what it says in the pacts, 10% target for renewable heat, which hasn't been achieved, um, and is you know, something for the future as we develop the new energy strategy. And the second target, 40% renewable electricity, and as you know, we, we have achieved the 40%. Um, it's, it's running around 42, 43, 44 on a rolling 12 months. Um, the achievement of that 40% target is an excellent one. It, it has been achieved because of the support of the NARO, the Northern Ireland Renewable Obligation Scheme. And it is a cost-effective way of achieving the target. Um, the way that has worked is it was an obligation on energy suppliers across the UK. And because of the situation with fuel poverty in Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland consumers paid proportionately less uh, of any cost. So there was a bigger obligation on suppliers in GB. Um, there has been a lot of investment in, in wind or in renewable energy capacity. We've come from a position of having three major fossil fuel power stations at Kilkira, Ballymumford and Kilroot to now having 23,000 microgenerators by the end of the NARO. Um, those generators are in the main solar installations at domestic homes, around four kilowatts. But the majority of the electricity produced is actually through wind. Um, and the installed capacity is around and about 1,600 megawatts. And the peak demand t today, which tends to happen around January when it's at our darkest, is 1,800 megawatts. So actually you can see that the installed renewable capacity is not far off the peak demand. But there is a limitation on how much renewable electricity can be on the system at any one time, and that is something that is an ongoing work by SUNY and NIE networks. There's been a massive amount of work done, um, reinforcements to the grid, and reinforce reinforcements to how the system is operated, updates to how the system is operated. And that has meant that now we've got to the position where at any one time 65% of the electricity on the network can be delivered through renewable sources. The target is to have that increased to 75% by the end of this year. So when you drive past wind turbines and they're not on, it's not because they're broken, it'll be because they're dispatched off because the system can't take them at that time. And that's obviously an opportunity cost when we've invested in the wind turbine and then the wind turbine isn't working. So part of what we're doing in the energy strategy is working out how we, A, increase the amount of renewable electricity that can be taken on the grid, but B, how else can we use that to ensure that the wind turbines will run up to 100% of the time? So I think it was worth emphasising that when policy is good, we can deliver really good things, and when it is bad, it obviously fails miserably. The important task that we're, we, we have to achieve is that set the pathway to net zero carbon by 2050, um, and that <coughs> is a difficult one because actually... You know, we've come from a position where it's all been about electricity and gas, and it's been about fossil fuel electricity and gas. We're now in a position where when the wind blows, which has been quite a lot during 2020, then wind becomes the price maker in the market and the fossil fuels follow. So we're in, a, we're in an exciting place, but we have a long way to go now, and there are going to be real costs associated with getting from where we are today, which is pretty much nowhere on heat, which is 50% of our mix, to, to, to 100% zero carbon intensity, and also in the electricity side, moving on from 43 44% <coughs> all the way to 100%. Not forgetting transport, which obviously <coughs> is pretty much petrol and diesel, and we need to look at removing the fossil fuel mix from transport. Um, if I ask Maeve, say a few words, just to carry on. No. Sure. Uh, thanks, Richard. 
So in terms of the energy strategy itself, what's really important to note is that the next energy strategy to 2050, if we're going to decarbonise the energy sector, isn't something that the Department for the Economy can do on its own. There are a lot of uh, cross-cutting issues. There are a lot of uh, areas of responsibility and uh, delivery of um, initiatives that can't be delivered by a Department for Economy in the sense that when we look at decarbonising transport, that's something that DFI has to be involved in. When we look at the overall contribution to decarbonisation, that's the, that's the role of DERA. When it comes to questions of energy efficiency and how we make our homes and businesses and buildings more energy efficient, that actually cuts across a number of departments and, and bodies such as Invest NI. When we think about fuel poverty and the role of consumers, we have to be in conversation with the Department for Communities. So when setting up our initial framework for developing a new energy strategy for a long-term framework to 2050, we started by engaging with all government departments and, and asked them to come together and sit in a, in a government stakeholders group. Um, so some, some departments are very heavy energy users, uh, health, <laughs> education, but others actually have policy responsibility or legislative responsibility for certain aspects of energy. So that, for, from our perspective, was crucial to start from a place where we weren't going to start butting up against policies elsewhere. So we're coordinated. So to that end, we ended up um, in collaboration with, with the other departments, uh, publishing a call for evidence in December of last year. And I do have a number of copies here. I'm happy to, to pass them around. Um, we still have hard copies left, like hen's teeth. Um, and so the call for evidence closes next Friday. And it is pretty much what it says in the tin. We are looking for better evidence and better data if we're going to decarbonise our energy sector by 2050. And that actually will account for decarbonising about two thirds of the entire economy between heat, uh, power, and transport. Um, then we need to be able to measure how we're getting there. And in order to measure how we're getting there, we need to know where we are now. And it's fair to say that there is a lot of evidence and a lot of data out there, but some of it is better than others. Some is a little bit patchy, some is a bit inconsistent. And so what we've done is ask a series of questions some very open-ended and asked for as much uh, feedback as possible in terms of evidence and, and evidence-based opinion. Uh, so in order to um, cut across these issues, we've subdivided our call for evidence into five key themes. And the first is consumers, because there's no point in, in uh, talking about energy unless it has a purpose, and that purpose is to heat homes or to enable people to travel from A to B or to turn on their lights. So the role of consumers and a potentially changing role of consumers as well, how we protect vulnerable consumers for the future. We look at energy efficiency uh, because I think there's widespread acknowledgement that we, we need to start by looking at where we can just reduce our energy use across a range of sectors, so energy efficiency measures. And we then look at the three key themes of, of heat. As Richard's already said, 50% of our energy use is due to heat. Um, we look at power, which is electricity generation. And again, Richard has mentioned the success in renewable electricity to date. And we look at transport. And as I've mentioned already, we're working very closely with other departments, and particularly in transport. That's an area where, where DFI is taking the lead. So the, the evidence that we are gathering, we expect uh, to receive a significant amount of responses to the call for evidence. Uh, it is only the first step in the consultation process. So it's, there will be further consultation, there will be policy options developed and, and consulted on. Um, but the, the template response to the, to the call for evidence has been downloaded now, I think, close to a thousand times. So we are expecting an awful lot of responses. And we have had a significant amount of engagement. People, business, community, the, the energy sector, the fuel poverty sector have all been very engaged up until now and have been keen to get involved as much as possible. So we have been open to speaking to anyone who wants to talk to us and, and listening to them. Uh, we've also had five key workshops across Northern Ireland in those five key themes. So they went from, uh, from Oma to Nuri to Armagh, etc. And up until... I think as of yesterday, we'd had something like 105 separate meetings, seminars, presentations, conferences, roundtables um, in the last couple of months with a range of stakeholders. So that's the business sector, the consumer sector, the energy poverty sector, etc. And the intention there has been to, first of all, ensure everyone is aware that this is what the department is, is doing and is, and is leading on and also to try and encourage <clears throat> as many people to feed back as possible and to provide evidence uh, where, where it exists. So that, I suppose, is the, the, the structure of the call for evidence, the key topics that we're hoping to hit and the, the engagement that we've had up until, up until now.
Okay, thanks, Maeve. <clears throat> I think as, as Maeve's got across, this is a, a complex, challenging and wide-ranging piece of work, uh, and therefore we've tried to put in place comprehensive governance arrangements to drive this forward. There's an energy strategy project board which has been established to oversee the entire development of the strategy. It's chaired by the Permanent Secretary uh, and also includes the Chief Executives of the Utility Regulator and the Consumer Council. Works also in hand to start to develop uh, an expert advisory panel to bring together national and international expertise to help inform what we do here. Other formal governance arrangements include a, a joint steering group, including the utility regulator, and also separate electricity and gas stakeholder groups to bring together the monopoly asset owners to help inform what we're doing. The project's been run in accordance with uh, good project management principles. We have a project plan, we have risk registers, issue logs, and we review those regularly to make sure we're on track and meeting the deadlines that we have to do. Um, as may have said, there, there's a big cross-governmental piece on this. Um, an early decision was made to bring together all the different government departments that are that are involved in this uh, to, to take forward the work. We've set up a government stakeholders group that they're participate on, uh, and they're also involved in the working groups and have been established to drive forward the work in the five themes that, that Mia has talked about. The need for these comprehensive and robust governance arrangements really is because this is this is a major shock and a major change that's going to be coming over the next few decades if we're going to get to net zero. Um, we need to get this right. It's a great opportunity. It's a very exciting time. But as Richard said, there will be costs, and so this needs to be based on, on all the available evidence and expertise we can draw on. That's why I suppose our next steps that we're looking at really is about evidence. So May has covered a lot of stakeholder engagement to date. We've gone out for a call for evidence. We have to look at the evidence that we get in. We have to see where the gaps are. And we have to take forward new evidence. Um, we have a priority to develop a comprehensive modelling and data analysis over the next nine to ten months to help inform then the future work beyond that. We'll be looking at technology costs by buildings in Northern Ireland, the fabric around them, energy demand profiles, energy costs and things like that to build a picture of how we use energy, where it comes from, what the cost of that is, and if we start to make changes, what the impact of that then could possibly be in scenarios around that. So the intention is then, after the call for evidence, that we will, we will do an awful lot of work on, on evidence uh, analysis and further research and put out uh, new options for a new energy strategy uh, in the, by the end of the fiscal year 2021. I don't envisage us being silent over that period. We need to be seen to be doing some of this work and we need to show the analysis and work that we're doing. So do expect to see things during that period as well as we take work forward. Um, so I hope that's been a helpful update from, from the three of us. Thank you very much. Um, for, for me, this, this is an absolute key strategy for, for uh, the time ahead. Um, and it is very positive to hear the, the type of cross-departmental working that is in place um, and, and the, the governance arrangements that are there to, to ensure that there is a joined up approach to it. Um, I, I have had very positive feedback in terms of, of the workshops that have been ongoing, um, that they have been very useful and um, um, very good uh, discussions that have, have <coughs> taken place in that, so that, that is also really positive. Um, I guess uh, in terms of the achieving of the, the net zero targets and looking at potential um, renewable targets for this strategy, um, I was wondering, would you have any thoughts on how that operates um, potentially in the absence of an overarching climate strategy? Um, is, is that a particular challenge? Um, and do you see that potentially climate legislation would be um, a good guide in terms of, of how we, we drive forward in, in achieving our, our net zero targets? Um, and also in terms of achieving the, the net zero by 2050, um, whether we and probably the more developed countries actually need to have um, more ambitious targets than, than 2050 to, to actually have any hope of achieving that? If I kick off on that, and that's the last part first, actually the global agreement, the IPCC, is on accumulated carbon dioxide and actually the analysis would show that we have to do it as quickly as possible, that net zero carbon by 2015 might not just be enough because of the accumulation of carbon dioxide. Why is this important? Because, you know, for the past 250 years we can see where Carbon dating will show us, ironically, that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was pretty close to zero until the Industrial Revolution, and then it started to spike, and it's grown and grown rapidly, and it's still growing. And it's just 250 years of what some people would say is four and a half billion years life for the planet. So it's been a shock to the carbon dioxide system, um, to, the, to the atmosphere. Uh, that carbon dioxide 
may well be causing global warming. So the answer to your question is we need to look at the optimal way of doing it as quickly as possible because we don't actually have an awful lot of time and other jurisdictions have got quicker targets. And then you can see a curve which might go like that towards net zero carbon and you can see a curve that might go like that and people said it needs to be a bit more like that, we need to do more sooner. As Thomas mentioned, when we, there are costs associated with doing it sooner. So coming back to the measurement of this, and this is going to be the importance, and this is why we really are taking the time to engage with all the people who have the answers as well as understanding where the gaps are. We don't know the carbon intensity of our energy mix. We can start with power and we can get there because actually there's great information on power. We know through the single electricity market the carbon intensity of every piece of electricity we produce and that has improved dramatically. And whilst we lead in terms of all the regions of, of the islands here, in terms of achieving 43%, we are actually behind because the balance is dominated by coal and distillate and natural gas. So actually a measurement that is the carbon intensity where it is now, and as may have said, baseline it and moving towards net zero. Net zero doesn't mean it has to be absolutely zero by 2050, but it has to be offset by carbon absorption. And this is where the dear uh, <coughs> conversation this week around planting of trees. It's really important. People can have a laugh at it, but the carbon absorption in trees and hedgerows and soil sequestration is really important because it'll get the parts that we can't reach on the, on the energy side. When we go to heat, which is 50% of the energy mix, we're not in a good place because we don't measure the amount of heat we produce. We, we have to do some significant work over the next nine months to get there because heat and oil dominates the scene here. Mm -hmm. You know, back in natural gas came in in 97, we, we pretty much got rid of quite quickly of heavy fuel, oil, you know, the really dirty stuff. But kerosene dominates the landscape and a bit of gas oil. We don't measure that. It comes in through import terminals on the foil and in Belfast lock. And that's it. <coughs> HMRC knows, but we try to talk about getting the information out of there. But it's not monitored. It's never been regulated. And we have a task in hand there because actually, uh, you know, some of the car some of the power products come in for transport and some of them come in for heat. We can go to the gas companies, of which there are three main um, uh, transportation companies here, and we can say how much gas and gas can be used as a proxy for heat. 65% um, of homes still use heat and oil, but by 2023, we will have gas available outside premises, 600,000 premises, leaving 280,000 premises without access to gas. So almost the initial thinking on this is on the gas grid, where we're already tackling fuel poverty and carbon intensity, where people are moving from oil to gas, with some energy efficiency measures are reducing the carbon intensity by 50%. And then off the gas grid in towns and villages where there's an opportunity for testing community heating and looking at the electrification of heat or, and so on, or potential hydrogen solutions with, with curtailed wind, for example. And then isolated rural dwellings, and this is where it's really important, the data input, because they're looking at the sustainable farm and isolated dwellings come into that, and there's a real opportunity to look at it in the round, and this is why the exciting thing of doing cross-government is, is a real opportunity. But getting to the targets means we need to understand our data and information, which we're not quite doing <coughs> this year. Um, and if I could just ask a, another uh, question. Um, you mentioned the gas infrastructure. Obviously, the gas infrastructure could potentially be used in the future around biogas as well. That, that's potentially an option. But... Um, in relation to what we currently have, we have no incentives anymore in terms of, of renewable um, heat or um, um, energy. So obviously that we have seen almost a, a flatlining of, of new, new projects there since the, the, the absence of that. Um, and I think while it's really important that we have you know, binding targets and statutory obligations on sectors in terms of, of cutting their, their emissions, we also need to incentivize both communities and individuals to, to be able to um, to move away from, from fossil fuels to, to renewable sources. Um, is that something that is going to be key in terms of, of the new strategy? I pick up. So, so yes, I mean, I think you're right to highlight the success that we've had, um, particularly in renewable electricity then, um, over the past 10 to 15 years. That was driven by two things. First, a target, which set a very clear ambition for where we wanted to be. And then second, a support mechanism in place to help deliver that, which was the Northern Ireland Renewables obligation, which, as we said, has been very successful at doing that in a cost-effective way. So 
Both of those things we're looking at in the day energy strategy. One, what is our target, particularly for 2030 on renewables? We need to know that because without knowing that, we can't set what sort of incentives could, could deliver that. The second thing then is, well, what support is needed to deliver that? What I would say is the technologies that, that we supported 10 to 15 years ago are in a very different place now than they would have been back <coughs> costs have come down, we do see subsidy-free projects going ahead. So we need to make sure whatever incentives and mechanisms we put in place are cost-effective and bring forward investment at the minimum cost to consumers. I think what we do know is that if we want to bring forward the scale of projects that we might be talking around with some of the future targets, we will probably need to look at some sort of route to market. There are different options around that, um, but certainly the work to identify those options, take it through and come to a decision, will be, will be taken forward through this energy strategy. Uh, and just I suppose, um one or two other things just to add on to that. So when we when we talk about uh, renewable sources of energy, for example, very often what we're talking about is an upfront capital cost but low running costs, which is quite different to the way that, for, uh, for example, how we heat our homes at the minute, um, which is there is an ongoing fuel cost. And so there are costs associated with these changes. We have to consider those, but it's also considering how the upfront cost, the capital cost, can, can be discussed at an earlier stage and addressed. And when we think of the large-scale the large scale projects, uh, we have achieved a significant amount of, of generation from renewable electricity, but at the same time we haven't any offshore wind uh, projects in Northern Ireland. And we had a discussion quite recently with the Crown Estate, they are the, the body that runs the leasing rounds uh, for, for seabed rights, and they are in the process of planning for, I suppose, an acceleration of consenting and development of offshore wind projects across, I suppose, particularly across the UK, particularly England, Wales, uh, England, Wales at the moment. Um, Scotland has a separate Crown Estate. But, uh, that is on the understanding that the UK government has set ambitious and very ambitious targets for offshore wind in the UK, and in order to deliver those by 2030, if we assume there's normally a 10-year uh, time period required to get an offshore project from, I suppose, concept, concept to, to delivery and production, if they're going to achieve the 2030 target at the UK level, they need to look at ways to reduce that, that 10 years uh, somehow, and Northern Ireland as yet with, with, with no offshore development needs to be part of that conversation. Okay, thank you. Um, Gordon, and just also to remind members, we do have limited time today, so... We have limited time this. today, so it will not be too long. <coughs> Thanks for your presentation. Um, gas generation plants, with, with, there's talk out there about new gas generation plants being built. How does that fit in with the strategy, and do you think that's a, a positive move? Um, in, in, in answer, yes. I mean, I mentioned earlier about you know, there needs to be a base load. There needs to be we need to have an ability to keep the lights on whenever the wind doesn't blow. Yes, sometimes yeah. the wind doesn't blow. Um, <coughs> um, it does up here. It, it has <laughs> a lot. Of it's it's times, yeah. But um, we do need the base load, um, and it's working out. Uh, it, that is all happening within the, the SEM, the single electricity market, and the single yeah, electricity yeah. market has delivered great benefits for, for consumers in this part of the world, and will continue to do so. Yes, there, there are ongoing capacity auctions, which are about long-term contracts, but that has already changed the shape. The old days of the big, massive plants of Bally Lumford mm -hmm. and Claret, mm -hmm. that, that, the market is demanding something different. The market is demanding the ability of a plant to be able to start up fast and deliver the electricity when the wind dies. So, so the answer is yes, mm -hmm. um, but you know some people out there, and, and this is an interesting thought. Some people out there say we should be building coal plants. So when you get out here, there's a lot of contention, and we will need to compare and contrast the the analysis, the, the evidence, in order to get to the right conclusion. Good. The other point you've had the stakeholders group. I assume you had the manufacturers in there and high energy users. They, they did attend, um, I think we had more than 300 people attend, so they were from across business, um, small businesses, yeah, yeah. large energy users, um, and we also spoke at a few uh, large-scale conferences and seminars where we had large energy users in attendance as well. <coughs> Quite a significant amount of engagement with consumers, both at the domestic and, and non-domestic level. Okay, good. The other point just you had mentioned, Richard, was about the, we're aware of battery storage plants being considered. Is that, do you see, that has been significant in trying to store this wind energy that's... Yeah. 
I mean, it's a, it's a great question because actually there is no silver bullet and all of the above. There are a menu of options and they all will apply to one extent or another and battery is definitely in there. And so part of the discussion then already through the single electricity market work, DS3 and the new DS3 project, it's about how we incentivise storage yeah, so that yeah. the wind <coughs> up longer whenever there's no demand. Okay, incentivising. What about incentivising um, the consumers to switch to gas where gas is available? At the moment, to do that, uh, it varies throughout the province, I understand. Some areas are good, some areas might have 60%, mm -hmm. while others might have 35%. Yeah. Well, gas has only arrived in, in, in a skilling, for example. Yeah. So that's down to the utility regulator. You know, they provide the incentive through the price control process, and, and they do a great job. And as you say, the reason why gas eventually ended up in in, in Derry Lynn and in a skilling is because of the success in the Greater Belfast area, where penetration rates are now 60% over 20 years. But the yeah. question for the strategy going forward is, how do we incentivize? Should we be incentivizing it more? Yeah. Should we be accelerating, or, sh or what should we be doing? Because you mentioned earlier, the chair, about biogas, but there's also future of hydrogen in the mix, where under an EU uh, regulation, uh, domestic appliances since 1996 can take up to a 20% mix of hydrogen along with natural gas, so that hydrogen can be produced by the wind that's curtailed, so this is how we're looking at properly across mm. and joining it all up. It still takes an average household or 2,000 odd pounds to convert, you know, so could we not be doing something there so, to so incentivize? Again, a quick sharp answer to that is, <coughs> this is going to cost. It's already costing people two thousand pounds to convert to gas, for example. You know, there's one example. None, you know, people look at electric vehicles and go look at the cost, but as as may have said, the upfront cost is more, but the running cost is less. So we need to work with consumers about how we mm. do this and do this best. Okay. Uh, we have obviously um, got well and wind. How cost effective is is all of this? So it's obviously been a very expensive project through the rocks process, which is now closed, isn't that right? So there's no more access to it. How, how is that stacking up in relation to cost? We're all aware, you know, the turbines are expensive. They have a reasonably long life. It was, what, 20, 20 years or whatever. You know, um, I suppose it's worth saying that um, when the NARA was set up in around 2005, then it's part of a wider UK scheme. So it operates across the UK. Yeah. Um, around 2009-2010 then banding came in and what that allowed was different technologies to have different rock levels and that meant that depending on the cost that those technologies faced that they would either get higher or lower levels of, of, of support to bring those <coughs> forward. Those rock levels then were reviewed regularly and they would have either came down or gone up depending on what's happened with the technology costs. So it was very much tied to the technologies and what was happening uh, with the costs on those. Um, also in terms of, I suppose, Richard had mentioned the cost-effective nature of the, of the narrow. Um, because it's part of a UK-wide scheme, it was paid for by all UK consumers. Um, the obligation level of energy suppliers was lower in Northern Ireland, which meant Northern Ireland consumers paid less for all the UK rocks that were, that were, were kind of being commissioned. So um, I, th I, think, I think the rock levels were set to reflect technology costs. It was done for in, in a cost-effective way for consumers. What we need to make sure is that what we do going forward in terms of any incentive schemes that are cost effective as well. Um, I think the nature of those types of schemes that are put in place now, they're, they're different. They're different than something like the NARA would have been. Um, they don't try and understand what costs are and provide a rate of return for that. They're market based, they're competitive, so the market dictates actually what demand and supply will be and what the cost will be out of that. That's how the, the new REST scheme down south works, it's how contracts for difference worth. That's probably how anything in place in Northern Ireland would work too. One, one final point. Um, <coughs> Because of the prevalence of wind, when the wind blows, it becomes the price setter in the market now, which means that a big benefit behind the costs is that the, the price we pay for the fossil fuel power is lower than it would have been if the wind wasn't there. So actually you get a significant benefit because wind is now dominating the price making. Reducing the, the cost, reducing it? Reducing the mm -hmm. overall cost. Right, thanks very much. Thank thanks, you. Chair. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm new to this committee, committee so uh, it's my excuse if I fumble through some of this or ask something that is blatantly obvious to somebody else. Uh, Richard, during your contribution, you had mentioned that we can't use the, the full capacity that wind is providing us. Is that correct? Is that... That's correct, yeah. How did we reach that position where we have installed more 
capability than we can use? Because the target that was driving that was the 40% target. Uh -huh. In order to get to 40%, we've actually had to install 85% of the capacity. So there's an example of one target driving an outcome. Mm -hmm. So it means that, but remember when we started this, so it's important to emphasize that <clears throat> only 10% of the electricity on the system at any one time could be a renewable source. The engineering advances that have happened over the 10 year period have been massive. So they've, they, that's moved from 10% to 65%. And ultimately, for example, the target set by air grid in the south is to be able to take 90% renewables on the system. And the direction of travel by Sony up here is to move towards 90%. So ultimately, this is a good thing because where we're heading is that the electrical demand. So for example, in the south, a lot of data centers are driving the demand up. One of the things here is because of the, the loss of some of our larger industrial loads, our electricity demand profile has remained flat. But we're heading into a place where there's going to be a significant growth in electricity demand. One, through some electrification of heat, like I talked about earlier, there will be heat pump technology. You know, isolated rural dwellings is a good example of potential for there. But there will be electrification of vehicles. And in this part of the world, we have 800,000 homes and we have over a million registered private cars. And if even a significant proportion of them start to go to, to electricity, then the electricity demand is going to increase. So in many ways, this is future-proofed. And then add to that, Back in the lab in school days, we, we all heard about electrolysis, where you pass the current between an anode and a cathode and you get hydrogen and oxygen. That oxygen can be used, it's a valuable gas, it can be used in the, the water industry, for example, to improve the efficiency of water treatment plants. But the hydrogen, hydrogen can be used in hydrogen fuel cells for transport and it can be used in the, to use heat. And it's the difference between natural gas, which is CH4, and hydrogen, which is H2, is there's no C and therefore it doesn't produce any CO2. <coughs> so I personally don't see it as a bad thing that we've got the 85% because the demand is going to be there. And if we're going to reach 90% plus of renewable electricity, then we've got to work out how we end, reduce the curtailment because we're going to need a lot more renewable capacity. But that, that's where it's important, as we have mentioned. It's not just about power, it's about powering transport and powering heat as well. Yeah. Makes sense. The more you explain to me, the more I question. <laughs> I, I'm looking at it from a, a money point of view. We've invested 80% to get 40% on the basis that if we build them, they will come. No, no, no. Uh, sorry, go on. So you're, sorry, but, uh, background, you're the wind expert. No, I suppose it's, it's getting the place of, we, to hit a 40% target, we needed to install a certain amount of, of renewables. Um, different types of renewable technologies have different capacities. And so it's slightly lower for it's lower for solar than it is for wind. If you have a taller wind turbine, you have a higher capacity. If you have an offshore turbine, you have an even higher capacity. So, no no generating station really is is being powered 100% of the time. So there are different capacities across all levels of, of generation. What we've gotten better at, and I think this is this is what's really exciting, is managing. So managing not just the supply, which we can't necessarily control because the wind and the sun don't always shine and don't always blow, but managing the supply but managing the demand. And it's that connection between the two. So when we have curtailment, if you imagine it's July, it's, it's 10 o'clock at night, the wind starts to blow, people aren't at, at work. Businesses aren't operating. There's no kind of heavy, heavy requirement of energy at that particular point. So it's times like that when the system operator has gotten better at, at managing that supply and demand, but we need to get better again. So that's the role of batteries, that's the role of let's charge the electric vehicles all at the same time when the wind's blowing and the demand's reduced elsewhere. Let's export that excess uh, electricity because prices are so low here, they could be going to another market. So it's that combination of factors, that matching of supply and demand that has gotten better and this in the, on the island of Ireland, system operators are effectively world leaders in, in matching that and, and expect to get better. Um, so it's not so much about you, you over-install in order to reach a specific target. I think from this point on, it will get much more flexible and smart as a system to plan for what is required 
and to take into account all the various areas of demand as well as supply? Uh, I will target it further at a later date because I'm conscious of time. Uh, in terms of cost, and, and I'll put, throw two questions into one just to speed things along. We have concentrated a lot today on the domestic market, uh, and obviously there's costs behind these things. Um, I, I would like to get to a position where the domestic market, in terms of families and, and, and workers, are taking on the tax burden of the investment, which then private, the private sector inevitably will benefit from. So who's going to pay for this? Um. All the consumers will pay, and you're right. You know, one of the things we need to work through, which is why we have a consumer work stream, mm. is that how that burden should fall. And the main debate on that is whether it's general taxation or whether it's paid for through bills. So, for example, the incentive that Gordon talked about for converting people to gas is paid for by gas consumers. The incentive on renewable electricity was paid for by electricity consumers. The renewable heat incentive was paid for by general taxation. So one of the big decisions going up is how are these paid for? And I think the watchword in all of this, we need to get an outcome that, allow, that allows our energy prices to remain competitive <coughs> for business so that we can generate a more better economy. But it also has to be a fair and just transition to ensure that the, the people in social need, the vulnerable in society, are able to afford energy. Because we shouldn't have fuel poverty in a developed country like this. But, but how could it not be a good business plan? If I, I set up a business and my customers pay for the investment into the infrastructure for that business, and then I tax, and then I charge my customers a monthly rate for that investment in the first place, how could you not make money out of that? Well, that, the point is that that's how our infrastructure is paid for in this part of the world, where, for example, in the wires and in the networks, it's mm -hmm. paid for over 40 years to spread the cost, proportionally so it doesn't drive short-term costs up and act, and act in account. But short-term costs up for who? Because we, and we'll be coming on to a different subject later on, nothing to do with yourselves. We have private business enterprises who charge their customers to install the infrastructure, to deliver the service to their customers, and then their customers pay the private enterprise for that service. How can you not make business out of that? Well, you know, is that a rhetorical question? It's a rhetorical question. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. John Sturt. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much for your presentation, your, your answers to date. Um, as a representative for East Antrim, I suppose we are, we are and have been the powerhouse of Northern Ireland for many years. And, um, uh, both in Kilroot and by Lumford, as you've alluded to, and both those um, plants have evolved over many years, I suppose, in, in light of emissions and, and recognise, I suppose, that there needs to be a change. Probably still a place for them within the security of supply, and, um, but there's no doubt need for the change that you've alluded to. Um, I have about a dozen questions here, and I'm conscious of time, but I'll just go on to a couple of them. Um, in terms of, you touched on particularly oil here in terms of home eating. We have an insatiable appetite for it in Northern Ireland compared to the rest of the United Kingdom and even parts of, of, the, of the Republic of Ireland. Um, and while gas has come in and we're seeing that, particularly in, in the east and, and further into the west and touching the figures about 600,000, there are parts of Northern Ireland that will never be able to access that network. And they are the ones that are hooked and remain hooked on home heating oil. What is the solution to get them off? Um, in terms of, of access and that, because I just don't see a point, and that to me is where the real problem will be. Um, I'll put my next one into it because it sort of does link in. You touched on the energy regulator and the great work that Jenny Piper does, and I do agree she does do great work within the remit and the confines that she's been given, which is to protect the consumer in terms of the, the cost per unit that they're paying. But do you believe or do you think that there is a need to extend that remit in order to broaden out um, in terms of the issue of the climate emergency and, and broadening out accessibility to gas, maybe if they need to up that, that cost to the consumer. Because I take the issue of infilling, for example. I represent Carrick, Fergus and Larne, and while the network is there, there are thousands of people who have their nose pressed up to the glass of, 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 of gas and can't get it because they live 36 yards from the pipe. And it costs them 10 grand to get it installed because the energy regulator won't sign off for Phoenix to install the pipe. They have to pay the connection cost. It's just that to me is madness. If we're trying to get them off oil and into gas, why is that policy still there? Perhaps that's something that could be looked at. Do you agree? Okay, just, to, yeah. just to answer very quickly the second question first. Um, 
that can be addressed now. That's I'd be pressing it for two years. <laughs> that, can, that, can be, that, that is being addressed now because it doesn't need a new energy strategy to do that. That's part of the existing regime. So that's the simple answer to that. Mm. The first question, maybe we'll pick up it's a an in very interesting one. It is, and, and Northern Ireland's not unique mm. in addressing that. The, the challenge for an awful lot of countries is those houses that are not on a, a gas network, for example. There isn't an answer. There's a range of answers. So we start by looking at energy efficiency. You know, what, what, is, what are the building types here? What kinds of houses are we talking about? And, and who lives in them? How is energy being used in them? So if we don't have energy efficient, isolated or rural dwellings, um, then we're going to have to work an awful lot harder to heat them. Then we need to look at the technologies that exist. There are technologies, there are heat pumps, which are primarily using ambient heat from either the air or the ground, and then they use electricity. And everybody, at least, nearly everybody, is connected to the electricity network. So there is that source. But those types of technologies are more effective with an energy efficient home. So that's why we have to think comprehensively about those homes. There very interesting one of the workshops there was proposals around pure bio oil just replace existing oil with bio oil now we've asked for evidence about that kind of information certainly it's not an area where i have expertise it's, it's a little bit unfamiliar but if there's capacity there to use that then then let's look at it so there are that there will be a range of solutions on areas where you're not necessarily talking about isolated rural dwellings and individuals, you may have communities where you have district heating <coughs> solutions and they may involve geothermal heat. And there's a specific question, the geological survey says, what, what is the matching of supply and demand with regards to geothermal energy in Northern Ireland? Can we tap into that? It is being tapped into elsewhere. So there is no answer, but there, there are a range of potential answers for those houses that are currently reliant on oil and unlikely to, to be close to a gas network. And the other point I'll just add there is we have asked some really fundamental questions in this call for evidence. And one of those questions is the regulatory environment, the legislation in Northern Ireland, and the governance of energy. So when we talk about getting to a net zero uh, economy or net zero energy by 2050, certainly, we have to be looking at and understanding what legislation currently is going to help us get there and what is going to hinder us or what new legislation is required. So very, very difficult questions to ask, but if we don't ask them now, when, when do we ask them? And we hope to get responses back that start to point out, well, this area of regulation may need to change in order to facilitate the transition to net zero, or this legislation is, has been helpful up until now, but won't necessarily deliver what is now needed to be delivered. So, I suppose on that, like, expect, to see, <laughs> expect to see the department back at, at a number of points over the coming years because these are such important questions that, 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 that touch on so many aspects of life. Okay, thank you. I think that will be the biggest challenge, just converting that and changing that mentality as well, the country said excess. Um, Richard, thank you for the answer on the accessibility of gas. I mean, I'd love to touch base with you after this, maybe directly, because that's as much as when I speak to Phoenix again last week, they're telling me they're still waiting on sign off from the regulator. The regulator's still saying they need to meet to pass this off. This is a real issue. These people want it now. They're registering daily. I'm pushing them. I've got 900 people in East Antrim who can access it or within 100 feet of gas and can't get it. And I've registered every one of them. I'm doing the doggy work here. Mm -hmm. And they cannot get over the line. So this is, could be a real quick win. So if we could get that pushed through as quickly as possible, I'd be really grateful. Um, two last quick things. You talked about uh, the need for not working in a silo mentality. I completely agree. Take the, the notion of um, electric cars. I mean, the UK government's committed to, by 2035, doing away with uh, diesel and petrol vehicles. They're installing, on average, 2,000 charging points a week. I don't think we're installing 10 a week. Mm. And, the fifth, and that's 15 years away from now. 15 years ago feels like yesterday, 2005. Do we have the capacity and is the infrastructure in place and what do we need to do to get ourselves in mind for in 15 years' time having enough charging points to make this country um, functioning with electric vehicles only? Because to me, that just feels like a long way away in such a short period of time. Yes. Good. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. I feel reassured now. <laughs> Get admitted. Excellent. As long as it's being done, I'm happy to hear that. Okay, Claire. Uh, thank you, Chair. Now, I suppose just to kind of somewhat follow on from John's point, um, do you feel it will be necessary to incentivise uh, big business to be able to help them to come to Northern Ireland and meet their targets? Um, or would it be more fortuitous to incentivise local communities and individual households um, in, in terms of what we need around that? 
Mr. President. It's, it's a really important question because, we, and it's a question that we ourselves are asking. So, we need to be thinking about when it comes to, for example, generation. Up until now, we've we've had quite a mix. We've had the, the 23,000 domestic micro generators. Mm -hmm. We've also had the smaller number of large scale renewables. The 23,000 individuals, I suppose, households involved in, in generating energy still only generate a, a small fraction of, of the, relatively speaking, handful of large generation. So there's, there's questions around whether we, whether we take a single approach or a range of approaches. Do we incentivise and try to engage more, much more at a community level? And there are, there's a couple of specific questions in there about how do we engage communities and how we create communities of energy, whether that's whether that's setting up renewable generation or whether it's uh, energy efficiency measures across communities. And we know there's examples that exist out there. We're not that, actually that familiar with examples in Northern Ireland. In the Republic of Ireland, there's been a very strategic approach to have sustainable energy communities set up and supported by the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. These sustainable energy communities are trying to raise awareness, provide expertise in communities to, to, to enable solutions at a community mm -hmm. level. Now, they've been going for a few years, so we haven't really seen the, the outworkings of that yet, but it would be really useful to get a sense of what that's delivering, not just for those communities in terms of a, an energy perspective, but if it's delivering additional benefits, so additional buy-in or, or commitment to sustainable, sustainable living, for example. Um, there is going to be a requirement for additional renewable generation of some shape or form, and we do need to, we do need to find out what the most cost-effective routes are for providing that renewable generation. And again, coming back to the earlier point of you're talking about upfront capital costs for long-term gain. So how you balance that upfront mm -hmm. cost with overall benefits and how that's spread across society. I suppose where I have somewhat of a difficulty, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that we have a number of big businesses who are coming from outside of Northern Ireland providing this service to be able to meet an energy target. I appreciate why we need to meet our energy target from a green perspective and a, and a renewable perspective, but I'm also conscious that as a government department, we're here to provide public services and we're here to satisfy the people of Northern Ireland. So what are the people of Northern Ireland getting out of this, not just in terms of the green energies and the renewables, but are their bills getting smaller? Um, you know, or are they having to put the, the, the initial capital costs into making their house green when actually really it probably benefits government targets more to do, you know, for them to help them do that? rather than it does the individual consumer. Because ultimately, you know, the first thing, and, and it does, I suppose, in a way, feed into the fuel poverty kind of um, concerns around it, is that people are going to first and foremost think about the costs of heating their home and, you know, and, and energy and all of those things. So should we not be maybe coming from that perspective and then everything else will follow in terms of what you need to meet around your targets? I suppose it's worth saying there's an awful lot of complex issues in those issues. It's not just one thing or another. Um, I think May has already talked about energy efficiency and the need to do that. So forget about generating energy. If you use less energy, you need to, you know, you need to generate less in the first place. So that's the first thing we need to tackle. That's a whole policy area on its own mm -hmm. before getting into actually where the generation mix comes from. Um, I suppose in terms of benefits to consumers, you've mentioned, apart from the green energy, to be fair, getting up to sort of 44, 45% is a huge achievement, and the, the carbon emissions from that the reduction that will be immense. Um, Richard's already mentioned in terms of the impact on wholesale prices, so it costs less now for wholesale prices than the same, and that's a benefit that feeds its way through to consumers as well. I think thinking about people and consumers uh, and communities as well, I mean, May has already mentioned on the narrow, the large majority of people supported in that are households with solar, so they can generate their own electricity. Once that's in, once that's there and it's supported, they don't need to, to pay for energy from the grid. And the more we do of that, the more they can generate their own. Um, even in terms of a lot of the wind, we have a lot of single wind turbines on farms and things like that. Those are consumers or small businesses. They're not large businesses coming in and doing that. Um, we do have to think, I suppose, the future and going forward, how we, how we support and incentivise some of this. What I would say is I've talked about the types of support mechanisms that are in place elsewhere are market-based. What that doesn't do is, is give any money out to big businesses. What it does is the market dictates a price, and it says if the price you get falls below that, then the consumer will support it. But if it's not, you don't get any. In fact, if it's above it, you pay that back. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that the, the market-based mechanism is probably more sophisticated to make sure that consumers don't pay more um, than they need to going forward. And but, sorry, go ahead. And yeah. Just a point in terms of benefit, and, and I was speaking to someone in Derry yesterday on air quality. 
and we talk about air quality and we talk about health outcomes and we mm -hmm. refer to them in this call for evidence because if we address some of these issues, if we address how we heat our homes, the energy efficiency of homes, the, the use of, of biomass, for example, in homes and in urban areas particularly, we will see improved health outcomes because living in a cold, damp home is not good for anyone mm -hmm. and excess winter deaths each year due to cold homes, for example, is something that we can also potentially address. And air quality issues linked again to the burning of solid fuels, but also emissions from transport. And if you look, at, especially at Belfast, those areas where there is higher incidence of, of asthma, for example, are, um, in children particularly, are in those parts of Belfast where there is, right beside major, major thoroughfares or, or major carriageways, for example. So we are thinking holistically as, far, as mm -hmm. much as we can about those other potential benefits. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Mr. Gibber, go on. No, I mean, there is no, it is going to cost. It's how it's paid for. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you raise all the, the right issues and um, there shouldn't be fuel poverty in a modern society like ours. We need to bear that in mind. People pay for things today. We happen to now, off the back of a crumbling oil price and gas prices, we have reduced gas prices announced last week, and we're likely to see reduction in electricity prices later in the year. These are the most benign conditions we're in now. It's just going to cost, yeah. but we need to wean ourselves off fossil fuels. That's not a choice, that's a legislative commitment, mm -hmm. not just here, but around the world, maybe just apart from the US, maybe yeah. we've walked away from it. But so, it's how we do it because it should we should do it in a just way and we should do it to try to provide as much opportunity, especially for small business. Yeah. Maybe we could be the leading exports of some renewable technology in the future. Okay. Yeah, and you know I appreciate everything you said and I think it makes sense that if we improve our air quality then maybe we won't have as many people within hospitals. So I, I appreciate and just generally I think you're how you're approaching this strategy is, is a good model to to all strategies strategies within government because I think it is really cross cutting. Um, I suppose my kind of concern is that I would rather be incentivising individual households than I would big, big business coming out of Northern Ireland. Because my understanding is that when domestic homes produce their own renewable energies, they're probably producing more than what they need, so they're sending that back, and that can be used more widely. I'm not sure if all domestic households across Northern Ireland can provide us with what we need in terms of of our targets in addition to their own homes. So I, I suppose that, and, and the other question I want to kind of ask as well, why do we not have indigenous businesses providing in Northern Ireland? Is it just that they have no capacity or is there anything that Invest NI could be doing to encourage, you know, maybe businesses from Northern Ireland to be providing these renewable energies rather than seeking from outside so that there's an, an economic benefit there too? Yeah. Uh, where am I taking the last point from actually? No. It, just just this, that, that, that point around where where we have those opportunities. If we look at the technologies that we're using at the moment, certain countries in Europe made decisions to invest and leap ahead. And so when we talk about when, when you're, whether it's installing a, a small scale turbine or a large scale wind farm, those turbines by and large will come from one or two countries in mm -hmm. Europe. Okay. Did we, did we miss the boat? Maybe that's one way of putting it. Okay. Are there areas where we could be getting ahead of that curve? So where, where are we looking at opportunities? For example, we did have the world's first tidal device connected to the grid in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. What can we build on from there? So there are maybe areas where we can get ahead of the curve and ensure that there is a Northern Ireland. Manu there is a manufacturing and engineering background that could support these industries, but that will have to be a conscious decision for those less commercially viable industries. But it is that opportunity. But that was just your last point. Yeah, yeah. I would just an element of caution on the issue of incentivisation. Because of the economies of scale, the incentivisation of larger opportunities yeah. tend to be more cost effective than the incentivisation of households. But the incentivisation of households is still very important because yeah. it's happening today and it needs to change how it happens in the future. Okay. Um, and just a last point, Chair, if you don't mind. Um, your 40% target, you mm. well surpassed that. Um, mm -hmm. Can I be cynical and say that it was maybe too low to begin with? And, you know, do, do we, um, what, what do you anticipate? Maybe 80% the next time? <laughs> I suppose it's worth saying that that 40% target, that originally started at, I think it was 10% a number of okay. years ago, went up to 20 and went up to 40. So the target was increased as we went along. Uh, what I would say as well is, to meet a higher target would cost consumers more. And so it's trying to get the right balance and the right pace of change. I think we've done fantastically well to make that, um, but certainly it's about ambition. 
over okay. the next 20, 30. Yeah. One of the key pieces of work within the energy strategy is looking at that future target, doing the analysis around it to say, well, if we set 60, 70, 80, whatever it might be, what does that mean in terms of capacity? What does that mean in terms of costs? What does it mean in terms of the network development? So once we put forward options on a target, we'll know what it actually means to meet that goal. Sorry, Chair, very, very last point. Um, in terms of opportunities that you were talking about, um, I, I was pleased to hear you talk about the opportunities around hydrogen, because I do understand that even our infrastructure in Northern Ireland is conducive to that, given that we have plastic piping rather than metal piping that we're seeing in other parts of the United Kingdom, which means that, um, 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 do we anticipate that even the likes of natural gas will be something we're moving on from in the future um, towards hydrogen and will that have an impact that if right now we're, we're almost going from oil to gas, are we going to go from gas to hydrogen and should we be you know, having that step ahead so that we're maybe not putting as much investment into the gas when we know that that as an energy in itself is going to become redundant? Yeah. So there's over a billion pounds worth of pipeline asset that is future proofed yeah. because it's plastic and one thing about this non-biodegradable plastic is that it will be there for a long, 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 long time. If we get to 2050 and hydrogen isn't working, well then that's a big issue because we can't decarbonise heat through gas if it's not hydrogen. Yep. Um, the decision point is down the road, but we need to do the right thing in the next five years and the next ten years. The, dis the solution on hydrogen will be solved elsewhere, but it will be tested very quickly here because we have the flexibility and the size and the, and the infrastructure to test it. Mm -hmm. And already. The gas companies here and the utility regulator are looking across the water and elsewhere in the world at what's happening with hydrogen projects. Okay. So the answer is it might well be, but there is a possibility that it might not. Okay. But we don't want to be a hostage to fortune of the Fair future. Enough. We need to work our way along the next 30 years. Okay. Thank you. Um, I guess just um, you mentioned the res in the south uh, as a, a model that works, and for some of what, what is being talked about about the community energy and also the incentivising business to to participate in the market. I think it's not one or the other; it's a, a mix of all of those. Um, and also, when you talk about um, supporting business here to to move towards um, renewable technologies, and we need to obviously upskill in that area too. But Green New Deal was one of the things that was committed to in the program for government, and I think there is real potential there if we are to grasp it within the development of our new um, economic strategy as well. That that that's something that that there is potential to to move forward on. So. Um, Sinead. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your briefing um, so far. Um, and I welcome your um, joined up approach and, and cross governmental approach. Um, what I would probably ask is what about cross jurisdiction, appro or jurisdiction approach to it as well in terms of an all island? Um, energy strategy and how important that is. And I think that we have got great resources here in, in, in Northern Ireland and on the island of Ireland in relation to our offshore um, capacity and our tidal and wave um, energy. And, um, and I'm just wondering, have we, um, are we in the process of exploring that, for example, with our universities? Um, how far advanced are we? What type of work are you doing within the department? And how joined up is that uh, across the island? And then the second one, if you, if you can kind of, it's a, it's a now question rather than a future strategy question, is about our security of supply as we stay, uh, stand here um, in, in relation to our, our energy and our electricity. Uh, and again, that's in an all-island context. And we talked about the, the, the data centres and uh, the demand for energy from the data centres, particularly in the Pro Republic of Ireland. Our problem here in the north is that we can't have big data centres because of our supply and our security there, and that is having an impact. And just another quick uh, quick uh, observation, I suppose, more, more than anything else, our um, energy costs here are very, very, um, very high for businesses and particularly for man manufacturing, uh, and, and that has a knock-on effect as well. So the three principles that you talked about, clean, sustainability, and, um, uh, and, and cost effective affordability are, are, are the key, but I think we have to work in the small island um, in the one context. So, so start very quickly, right. and lots, of, lots of issues. I mean, the, the, um, the issue of um, security of supply, we need the new interconnector because the new interconnector will reduce costs of electricity. Yeah. The cooperation, north and south, 
is really evident in the single electricity market because it's driving down costs for consumers in Northern Ireland and driving down costs for consumers in the Republic of Ireland. Um, in terms of cross opportunities, there's a brilliant Northwest Regional Partnership Initiative, and we are engaged with it, and they are engaged with DARE and the whole climate change. But it's a partnership between Donegal and DARE in Strabane, the local authority. Um, we are looking, Maeve was only working last week, on potential options for the Peace Plus money that's going to be available for the next yeah. six years. So, um, and one of the real potential projects is to build on the work that's been done in the Northwest because it's about, you know, ironically, unlike the weather maps, the wind doesn't stop at the border. Yeah. <laughs> so, there's a real opportunity that is really community solutions mm -hmm. in, you know, across the piece, which we are very focused on, and we have great engagement, you know, north and south across the piece. No, just, I mean, we, we do, we're very conscious of the, the connectivity. Or, or, or in some cases lack thereof in Northern Ireland. And we, we refer specifically to that here as well in the mm -hmm. call for evidence and, and ask for feedback. So Richard's already mentioned the obvious single electricity market and whether, if you're operating that market on an all island basis, and obviously we are now and, and hope that, that that continues, what needs to be done on both sides of the border to ensure that that's effective and we don't end up with kind of clunking uh, areas where there's potential policies that start to hit up against each other and make that market less effective. So that, that coordination is, is important. But at the same time, we have connectivity with, with GB. We have a, a different electricity market, but we are connected to that market through an electricity pipeline, gas, uh, electricity network and a gas pipeline. The policies that affect Northern Ireland, when we talk about the 2050 net zero target for decarbonisation, that is a UK government policy, and that's where we started from in the absence of, in reference to your earlier question, uh, Kiva, that's where we started from in terms of Northern Ireland specific targets. We went for, we, we were working within a UK context. So there is, there's, there's areas where we have to look at maybe where the strengths are and where the potential opportunities are. And in some cases, they may be looking at an all island network on an all island basis, and in others, it may be within the policy framework. Uh, at a UK level, and I suppose particularly pertinent at, at this point in time with regards to the EU exit and ensuring that we're, mm. we're possible, we are in the room having those conversations mm -hmm. uh, with other policy makers so that we don't end up with two speed markets, for example. Okay. Could, could I come back to the point on in, industry's costs? Yeah. The reason why um, our costs for industry are higher than the cost for industry on the rest of the island is because of a decision by government mm -hmm. in Dublin to cross-subsidise business costs from domestic consumers. So domestic consumers pay much more. Our mm -hmm. domestic prices and small business prices are the lowest, both when comparing it to the Republic of Ireland, GB and a lot of Europe. But as Stephen Kelly has said many, many times in Manufacturing NI, we have the highest manufacturing costs. Yes. So. The big issue there is a political decision. I cannot, for the sake of me, say why we would make a decision against the economics, which is cross-subsidise industry with domestic consumers. Because effectively how it is done at the moment by the utility regulator and the network costs is it allocates according to use. And I think that's appropriate. However, it does lead that challenge of, of uh, competitiveness. Mm -hmm. But the way to tackle that is to use less energy. And if I might add at this point, there is a really important government project that was signed off a couple of years ago by the, the next board in, 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 when the assembly wasn't sitting, and that is that government, central government across all the departments is committed to a 30% reduction in the energy that we use by 2030 in order to protect against future energy cost increases. And big users like the Department of Health are fully engaged, Department of Justice and Department of Education are fully engaged in that. But what it needs is a revolving fund to allow invest to save projects. And this is back to the the cost and the Green New Deal. We need funds, not funds that are grants, but funds that over a period of four to five years can be revolved to do the right thing to reduce the costs of the industry and in the public sector. Thank you. Christopher? Thank you very much. Do you think ESB is doing enough to improve the Northern Ireland grid? Um, it's not the ESB, it's NIE Networks. Who's own, who owns NIE Networks? ESB. Okay. 
but the but the the jurisdiction is Northern Ireland. The licensee holder is NIE Networks. Mm -hmm. NIE Networks are required to have the correct governance in place. They have a board with an independent chair and non-executive directors who are there to protect the interests of the Northern Ireland consumer. It is an excellent governance model and NIE have done a great job since it doesn't matter who the owner is, they've done a great job in facilitating the um, access of renewables, etc. over the past 10 years as we've gone on our renewable base. So, you know, I think from my experience in the past as eight years as a non-executive uh, board member of the utility regulator, I would say that the NIE networks model in terms of it is a it's pretty much a best in class electricity networks business. Governance um, is, an, is the, the relevant word. So who owns Sony? Airgrid owns Sony. And who owns Airgrid? It's a it's a semi government company. Semi state body, so it's the Irish government owns so, Airgrid. And, and 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 as you're aware, Christopher, there is a significant on, ongoing investigation into the governance of Sony mm. um, and that has been handled by the utility regulator in a very transparent and formal way. As you know there's been a call for evidence and you know there's been further questions and that is very live at the moment and it's probably better that I don't say anything more about it. Sony, uh, according to their website, plans and operates the electricity transmission system in Northern Ireland. There's issues there, isn't there, right? security and our position? No, I think what's really important is to come back to what we're doing here. NIE Networks has a network that is a Northern Ireland network. Mm -hmm. ESB has a network that is the Republic of Ireland network. It's they just happen to own the Northern Ireland one yes, as well. But, but as I explained, the governance arrangements there are best in class. System operation is different, especially in the context of the single electricity market. The single electricity market is operated by CMO, which is 50% owned by Sony and AirGrid. Sony necessarily have an integrated operation. We have resilience. We keep the lights on because the operation of the market is on the island basis under the single electricity market. That helps keep the light on, lights on at the most cost-effective price. Mm. That doesn't, though, that is important to be done in the context of the license under which Sony operates. And that's the matter that the utility regulator is addressing at the moment. People operating the Northern Ireland grid have to make decisions in emergency circumstances. Who do they pick up the phone to? Or do they make those decisions independently? So, for example, um, in the current situation with the coronavirus, you obviously would be aware that there's a lot of planning going on in terms of emergency planning um, of what to do if people end up having to self-isolate and not be able mm -hmm. to um, attend work. One of the things that Sony are doing at the moment is carrying out this planning and coordination role and they are in touch on a regular basis with Kilroot, Ballylumford and Kilkira to ensure that those power stations will operate even in the eventuality of an emergency. So I think the answer to your question is that Sony engage with the generators and NI networks to ensure that the lights stay on in the most cost effective way. Do they engage with their owner? Well that's, that's a matter for Sony and, and its owner. Okay. That's fine. Gary. Gary. Thanks, Chair. Um, obviously, topic of the day is around the, the energy strategy, and um, obviously we're hearing a lot of um, sort of uh, information around stakeholders and engagement and across the departmental. And I think we all get the fact that this is something which affects uh, every department, it affects all of us. Um, what engagement do you have with local authorities? So, for example. Um, I know that there's a lot of scepticism, particularly west of the province, when it comes to uh, infrastructure, wind turbines. You know, we have our fair share of them. Given our location, of course, uh, I think it's it's fair to say that uh, they're necessary. But what what, what uh, conversation did you have with local authorities? So we have invited uh, local authorities to to be part of our government stakeholder group, and we had a presentation to Solace, the chief executive body um, of the local uh, local government, about three or four weeks ago to go through the energy strategy. It's really important that we have local authorities engage properly and thoroughly with the development of the energy strategy because to a certain extent, while the strategy itself is a Northern Ireland piece, an awful lot of the delivery is going to have to be uh, looked at at a local level or a community level. You know, yeah. And we still we don't have any kind of predefined routes for that delivery. But if we don't involve local authorities, for example, uh, the role of planning, 
the role of local development plans and, and uh, economic regeneration and development, um, then, then we'll end up with something that may not work uh, from a local government perspective. So we are having those conversations. And it's around looking at what needs to be done, so the responsibilities and the roles, and where the, where the work therefore needs to be done, but also where the, where the benefits accrue. And as, as you mentioned, rightly west of the ban is where the majority of renewable generation is. That's where the majority of the business rates income from renewables yes. uh, comes to as well. And it's thinking about Northern Ireland as a whole with regards to where our energy is generated, how it's, how it's used and where the demand is, but also how the benefits can accrue. Uh, I suppose to a certain extent, we need to be conscious of the skills that are going to be required for the energy transition, the jobs that will be available, and rather than assuming that they will be located in one particular part of the country, we yes. need to be thinking about how we ensure that those jobs are, are accessible across Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. And so it's, again, it's one of the sections that we ask about is, is what are the skills required, how do we deliver those skills, and who delivers them? And where are the opportunities in the low carbon sector? Yeah, well, I, I very much welcome that because I, um, I do think we need a consistent approach, but I do think as well that we need to ensure that we do have the buy-in. Um, so, so that's very much welcome. Um, my second point is around um, you know engagement with consumers, and I absolutely take John's point in that you know consumers uh, ultimately will go and, and be led in terms of uh, price and what's cheapest and what's best for them economically, and that's understandable. What engagement and how do you engage with consumers in developing the strategy? So I suppose there's um, a couple of different layers of that. Um, uh, Thomas mentioned at the start the role of the Consumer Council and the utility regulators as protector mm -hmm. of consumers on our, on our project board. Mm -hmm. And with all of our working groups, so consumers do feature heavily. The engagement part of it, um, so for example, yesterday I was speaking at the Fuel Poverty Coalition workshop, which was organised by National Energy Action, uh, but had a range of different organisations and individuals in attendance purely to respond and develop a response to the energy strategy. So we've had similar events. We had a consumer workshop in Belfast three weeks ago. And that had, I think, six, 60 or 70 people attending. Mm -hmm. And the Consumer Council and, and Utility Regulator spoke at that as well. So I suppose that, that's the, the direct answer to your question. But it is a really important question because, again, going back to the point of there are changes coming. And they are big changes to how we travel and how we heat our homes and even mm -hmm. how our homes look in terms of how they're insulated. In order for people to buy into that, there needs to be an awful lot of communication and also an agreement as to the key messages. So why are we doing this? And it's something that, that's not something that the Department for the Economy has within its gift to deliver on its own. That has to be a message that comes from all spheres that these changes are important, they are required, but as, insofar as, as we can to bring people with us. I suspect that we don't have the answer as to just how we bring consumers with us, but we do specifically want to understand the, the channels through which people get their information at the minute, for example. So if you're sitting in your house and you're thinking of installing a heat pump <coughs> or sheep's wool insulation, who do you, who do you call? Yes. There's a number of agencies with different remits. There's, you can get some good information from here or there, but how do you know it's trusted? There seems to be a real, real demand out there for good information and knowledge. And people are saying, a lot of the workshops have brought this up. They've said, where do you go for this information? Where do you go if you're asking about a grant? And the suggestion has come back, we need a Northern Ireland wide sustainable energy body. Mm. The alternatives have come back and said, no, we need councils to deliver these, this kind of information because they're trusted voices. OK, really interesting range of potential mm. solutions there. Mm. But that information is a really important part of that. And more broadly, how we communicate these societal changes is, is not something just for the department to consider, but for, I think, an awful lot of us. But, yeah, but ultimately, we need someone to take the lead on that. Yes, agreed, agreed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. John. Um, the points are largely covered, but uh, most parties just got a presentation with the Carnegie Trust mm -hmm. in relation to well-being legislation or well-being programmes the government should be involved in. And the more I listen to this, it's actually, uh, in, in terms of your point, uh, how we, we, we tackle fuel poverty, how we ensure that there's greater benefits from this, and, and the consumer understands, or, or the citizen understands, uh, why government is heading in this direction. Uh, that overall overarching government policy of well-being is the way forward. But that's just a comment. Can I also have a copy of your report? Oh, 
Please. I've got one for you, Sanky. Yeah. Do you want me to hang on? Those will be circulated. Those. One for the audience. Should I hold back? Yeah, no, I, I would just come in on what John said there as well. I think sure. that when we are talking about um, transforming our, our economy and society towards net zero, we, we do really need to look at it in the, the context of a just transition and, and to ensure that those who are um, least able to afford it aren't the ones that are left paying the, the, the bill. Um, and I think that that is something that we really have to um, feed into the, the, the broader energy strategy and other strategies. And just a final point on what Sinead was saying around the, the uh, likes of the big energy users like data centres. I think that's something where we are looking across departmental. We need to look at building regulations and everything else. Um, and I think that you know that, that has to be key, that, that those things are, are done in a very joined up way. Um, I think that's us with the questions for now. Thank you. Um, so thank you, thank you very much, and I'm sure we'll be engaging with you further. <laughs> really, really useful. Okay, so members, we're moving on then to item number five, which is our briefing for on Project Stratum. Um, there is a clerk's memo on page 21 of your pack, and there are a series of slides from the department on page 25. So um, I, I would like to, to welcome our, our officials here. Yes, I can just um, remind members that we have our um, short inquiry into the, the future of energy um, on the 29th of April. Um, we've got in the pack there a um, list so far the stakeholders we're inviting. It's small scale largely because we're in room 115, so there's only a certain number we can fit in there. But we've got about 25 we're bringing in. Um, there's just, if members are content, we go ahead and put out the invitation and get the planning underway. Um, it'll be a, a round table format. The stakeholders will meet in a round table um, discussion with a set number of questions that are in the pack. Then the committee will meet simultaneously doing its normal meeting. Then we meet together for the round table feedback, which will be, I'm hoping, my fingers are crossed when I say it, hand started. And we will then turn that into a mini report, which the committee can then bring to the chamber. It just short circuits the very lengthy time it can take for a full on inquiry, but it means we can get it into the chamber a lot faster. Wow. Just conscious of how much is already going on around the energy strategy. It's important for the committee to be able to bring forward some views on that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to welcome to um, our meeting Geraldine Fee, um, who's the Assistant Secretary DFE, um, Nigel Robbins, Grade 5 Telecoms, Eamon Blaney, Blaney sorry, Grade 7 Telecoms, and Trevor Forsyth, Grade 7 Telecoms. So if you want to make a, a, an opening statement, and then I'm sure members will have questions. Okay, thanks very much, Chair. Um, well, as you said, I'm Geraldine Fay. I'm the Director of Tourism, Telecoms, Minerals and Petroleum in the Department, and I'm the Deputy SRO for Project Stratum. Nigel Robbins is the Project Director, Trevor Forsyth, Project Manager, and Eamon Blaney, Project Assurance. We're very grateful to the Committee for the opportunity to update you on, on Project Stratum. As you will be aware, the project was developed to utilise the additional £150 million broadband funding from the Confidence and Supply Agreement to improve connectivity for those premises unable to receive broadband services of 30 megabits per second or greater. In recognising the rural focus of the project, DERA subsequently agreed a further contribution of £15 million. We understand that DERA will be bidding for their capital funding to support this project. I think it would be useful for the committee if I tried to clarify at the outset that we are very conscious of the recent commentary on the withdrawal of the confidence and supply funding following the new decade new approach agreement. And we recognise that it is very important to remove any doubt in relation to the funding. And our minister has written to executive colleagues asking that the funding be confirmed for the next four years. And we understand that this issue will be considered in the context of the executive's wider 2021 uh, budget discussions. However, we also understand that the Department of Finance has been engaging with Her Majesty's Treasury in this matter, and at this time, there is nothing to suggest that the funding for this project will not be made available. Clarity on the funding, however, is particularly important given that we're at mid-procurement stage. Uh, with that in mind, Chair, I think I should also say that we the team needs to be careful today in terms of what it says, given that the, the procurement is ongoing. To, to give you just a very quick overview of where, of where the project is, 
Um, as you know, it's a transformational project which has the potential to positively impact on the lives of citizens and the productivity of businesses by providing infrastructure to support access to broadband services. Over 95% of, of the premises within the target intervention area and therefore eligible to benefit are rural. That's rural within the definition of Nisra Bandage. Settlements of fewer than 1,000 people are an open countryside. We anticipate contract award in September 2020 and the tangible benefits will begin to be seen in the remaining two years of the executive's mandate with completion by March 2024. It's important to point out, however, that the £165 million of public funding is not a budget to complete the task. That's why the GAP funding model is used to encourage and support private sector investment, with public funding being used only to bridge the gap for premises where no commercially viable solution can be provided by the market. Under the current project timeline, the evaluation of tenders will commence in June 2020. Bids will be assessed and scored against a range of, of published criteria. A key criteria will be the extent to which the supplier is able to deliver next generation access capable broadband services across the target intervention area. Obviously, the size of the supplier contribution will be pertinent to how many premises can be addressed. So I hope that's a, a useful um, snapshot of the, the key elements of the project. I'll hand over to Nigel, um, who can talk to you about the slide deck, which was already provided to the committee, if you'd find that useful. Okay. Thank you, Geraldine, and uh, good morning, everybody. The slide deck uh, illustrates, I think, the connectivity challenges across uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, so perhaps I can articulate uh, some of the reasons we've included the information we have and just uh, draw on some of the key points. Uh, further to Geraldine's overview, uh, the singular aim of the project uh, is to utilise all available funding and to maximise uh, coverage across the target intervention area. So we often say uh, coverage is our currency in that regard uh, because we want to address as many premises as possible. The target intervention area is uh, 79,000 premises. Uh, across Northern Ireland, uh, as we've heard, 95% rural. The, the actual figure is 96.8% rural, completely rural. So 97% very close to uh, open countryside and uh, deeply rural premises under Band H. Uh, and in Northern Ireland, the rural population, as you will well know, is more evenly spread mm -hmm. than in other parts of uh, the UK. Uh, Northern Ireland has the longest average telephone line length in the UK and four times the UK average number of telegraph poles per capita. So you know, that also illustrates part of uh, the challenge. It's a unique landscape, uh, and in many respects the, the project is, is, is unique in that it aims to serve um, an underserved uh, part of the community. So those are some of the reasons why uh, the broadband connectivity gap exists. Uh, and there are, in the slide deck, uh, some pages that illustrate that. Uh, drawing on the Ofcom figures, the broadband connectivity gap uh, slide shows that uh, across Northern Ireland as a whole, we focus on the column uh, 30 megabits per second, that's the, the, the super fast definition, uh, and we'll come to why, why that benchmark is set uh, for the project. Uh, but if you take the 30 uh, starting point, then across Northern Ireland, 89% of premises can access broadband services providing those speeds. But uh, in rural Northern Ireland, that dips to 68%. And so not only is there a connectivity gap between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK, uh, which has transpired over recent years, in 2009, Northern Ireland was actually ahead. <coughs> Uh, not only is that gap there, but there's also an urban-rural gap in Northern Ireland, and the draft programme for government uh, references that, and Project Strata aims to you know, redress that balance. Uh, so we're drawing on the uh, scheme called the National Broadband Scheme 2016. Uh, the state aid uh, cover uh, under that scheme is provided by DCMS's uh, division, broadband, um, uh, building, um, digital, sorry, they changed their name recently, UK. So BDUK is the department we refer to that we engage with regularly. Uh, and within that department, there's a, another department called the National Competency Centre, and they, they manage the state aid uh, <coughs> guidance under that scheme, NBS 2016. But one of the terms of that scheme is that uh, we as the department must be technology neutral. Uh, so we, we never recommend one a technology solution over another. However, uh, during pre-market engagement uh, for this project, industry made it clear 
that they see Project Stratum as a fibre-led uh, intervention, and part of that is based on a, a fairly recent uh, UK government policy shift, um, which puts fibre at the forefront of interventions. Uh, there's also uh, a healthier uh, shelf life uh, with fibre compared to other technologies, such as copper-based, uh, for example. Um, and so a return on investment over 25 years is a very reasonable uh, view to take with fibre. So all of the suppliers, uh, and we were uh, engaging with suppliers in the double figures, uh, spoke of uh, fibre to the premises. However, uh, in every country, the intervention has uh, required a blend of technologies. We expect this to be no different, and fixed wireless access providers would play a vital role in many hard-to-reach areas where there is a line of sight to a premises, and so there may well be an element of uh, fixed wireless access as long as it's uh, NGA compliant. So when we say NGA, uh, as uh, Geraldine mentioned, next generation access, the, the <coughs> Ofcom uh, summary or definition of that is new or upgraded access networks that will allow substantial improvements in broadband speeds and quality of service compared to today's services, so it's very much future-proofing. So although there's a 30 megabits per second benchmark, and that's uh, aligned to the draft PFG and to the state aid guidance under NBS 2016, it's highly likely that the majority of premises that uh, are going to benefit from the uh, upgraded or the uh, installation of infrastructure will be able to access the fastest speeds uh, possible and that's very much our, our hope and that's in the gift of the of the industry and the suppliers so uh, to summarize the in the slide deck there's also a broad spread of targeted premises and and we've included that to illustrate the broad swath of Northern Ireland where this challenge exists so there are no convenient clusters if you like across that 79,000 it is everywhere um, and we consider that the entire intervention area a priority all of those 79,000 premises are beyond the scope of commercial deployment and therefore must be addressed we consider it we will consider it a success when they are all addressed uh, one way or another, and the intent is to very much encourage industry to invest and contribute on top of the available public funding in order to achieve that aim, because, uh, as stated, the $165 million is a is a fantastic sum of money, but it's not a budget that was created to solve a problem. Uh, we believe that uh, the industry contribution will be vital uh, to solve that problem. We're in the middle of a procurement, and it's a competitive procurement, we're pleased to say, and we're delighted to see uh, a number of, uh, of high-grade uh, telecommunications entities uh, participating in this, and they're all very capable and deserving, uh, and putting a lot of resources into uh, putting their best uh, bids forward. Uh, the uh, closing date for the uh, submission of tenders is May the 5th. Also in the deck, we've included some maps for illustrative purposes, uh, which uh, would illustrate the sort of patchwork quilt connectivity challenge of the landscape. It's an inconsistent uh, connectivity landscape. You would see in the maps, uh, which are uh, broken down to constituency level, but also in Northern Ireland as a whole, uh, by small area, there are dark blue patches and light blue patches, and those would illustrate the dark blue would be where there's a higher percentage of premises that can access uh, services delivering 30 meg or above. The white would be you know, the opposite, uh, uh, much fewer. However, at a granular level, deployment will indeed need to focus on some of those blue areas, uh, but uh, the majority will be in those, uh, those white or those, those, those grey areas. It really illustrates that, uh, that missing jigsaw puzzle uh, landscape that is is the intervention area, the target intervention area. But whether it's uh, whether it's for Manor and South Tyrone, where there are close to 13,000 uh, premises, or Foyle, where there are 103, uh, we consider all of those premises to be a priority and uh, in need of uh, um, high-speed broadband services. So the next steps, just to conclude, would be closure of the. Uh, submission of bids on the 5th of May, we would anticipate uh, evaluating the evaluating ancient panel uh, going through the bids in June uh, following the state aid quality assurance uh, provided by BDUK through the month of May. And then through the uh, governance protocols, um, project board, advisory panel, gateway review, casework, uh, more state aid uh, assessment, we would be, uh, I very much hope, in a position to award contract following uh, ministerial approval in September of this year. 
So uh, I hope that helps um, highlight some of the key aspects of the project, and of course we'd welcome questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I suppose broadband, and particularly if you're a representative of a rural area, is one of the issues that is um, most highlighted to, to us, um, particularly um, when we're out in the doors during elections. You know, it is a real bugbear to people who cannot access it at all. Um, and it is, so this, this project is welcome. The focus on those premises who aren't able to access it is very welcome. Um, I have just two quick questions and then I'll bring in other members. Um, recently it was announced that there were about 18,000 less premises needed um, the, the access. I was just wondering how, how that came about, um, that there were 18,000 less um, needing the access to the 30 megabits. And also in terms of the um, infrastructure that is likely to be put in place as a result of the project, will that there be open access to other inter internet providers? So. Yes. Uh, so the, uh, the, so the 18,000, so, uh, the original uh, open market review um, exercise uh, defined the intervention area at that time as 97,000, and that captures data that the department has received, and, uh, and, and Trevor uh, will expand on this uh, at a single point of time, and our single point of time was when public consultation closed in uh, January 2019. So that assesses the data, and that's how we arrived at the 97,000. When we launched procurement, uh, during the procurement process, and as recently as uh, January, uh, it uh, came to our attention that uh, as a result of a national uh, UK-wide uh, data refresh exercise uh, by a supplier and in response to additional data that was submitted to the department by suppliers, uh, that there was going to be an impact on their target intervention area. And through engagement with BDUK, it was uh, agreed that the impact was uh, significant enough to revise the ITT documentation, update suppliers, uh, the bidders, at the point in time when we could, early on in the procurement process, uh, and, uh, and reset uh, the target. And the reason for that is that uh, the vast majority of the 18,000 are based on this UK-wide uh, data refresh where uh, the supplier has adopted a new methodology at premises level uh, that provides a far more accurate uh, speed analysis by premises rather than pure connectivity or, uh, or, or a range. The, the access of uh, speed data is more accurate and that process has now been validated by BDUK who have assured the process. They have indeed for other contracting authorities and local bodies and it was indicated that the the refresh exercise could have a positive, a negative or a neutral impact on existing contracts or indeed on interventions and we, we, we were heartened in, in many respects by the fact that it was considered to have a positive impact on Project Stratum because it reduced the number of uh, targeted premises and therefore would suggest that the available funding may go further but the, uh, the vast majority of the 18,000 was a result of that data refresh exercise. As soon as we had that information we, we, we challenged the supplier for more information um, and more assurances uh, and then updated uh, the bidders and published an addendum to the OMR uh, and uh, that was in recent weeks. So just uh, following on from that, is that then an average speed per premises? That, so it's not a speed at one point in time that's measured and therefore you know is subject to go up or down or, or whatever no as i understand that this is a, as a result of an initiative from ofcom who were tr saying that we want to make sure that the speeds that people will get are the speeds that the service will will deliver and they've come up with new methods by which those speeds sh should be estimated um, it's also come about as a result of these suppliers getting more information as to how their network is behaving um, because they've had subscribers on the line and that gives them a much better idea as to the characteristics that are in that area. And as uh, Nigel has said, some areas the performance has improved, some it hasn't maybe as improved as much as they had hoped. Um, we had to be mindful that uh, we wouldn't ultimately want to have to pay for services mm to someone who could already get a good broadband service uh, that we were looking to target at this stage. The department is satisfied that it has interrogated the data that has been provided by the suppliers to, to the degree that it is able to, you know, 
ratify what what has been put forward? Yes, and that uh, and that that process has been assured by BDUK. We are now satisfied that the, the the refresh exercise itself on a UK national level uh, is is validated and can be adopted uh, by uh, local bodies or contracting authorities. In our case. If there are any citizens that uh, have queries, we, we always welcome uh, contact with the department. We continue to address um, anomalies and, uh, and, and general questions and specific questions from citizens, um, and I'm sure that process will continue. Uh, and to address your Still second question, to... Chair, and the, the infrastructure, uh, once it's deployed and is available, the consumer will have choice. So the consumer will have a choice, of course, whether or not to take up the service. We very much hope uh, consumers will. Uh, but it will be an open access network, so no supplier will have a monopoly on this. Uh, the prices will be uh, benchmarked and quality assured again by BDUK uh, to ensure that uh, it's very much a fair and level playing field and there will be a range of services uh, uh, available to the consumer as a result of Project Stratum. Thank you. John? Um, uh, <coughs> the project needs to be welcomed, but I, I think there is uh, questions yet as to whether we will have success uh, in this regard. And in relation to the lessons learned from what has happened in, in, in the UK, uh, what, what lessons has the department learned from that in the sense of, in particularly in terms of the private enterprise's contributions and role within that building process? Yes. Uh, well, the private enterprise contributions, we did see uh, a decline uh, before the UK government policy shift, uh, which moved away from a reliance on fibre to the cabinet copper-based uh, solutions to fibre-led solutions. And so the decline was because you know, pr the private market was not necessarily seeing a return, a long-term return on investment. Uh, <coughs> there there, there, there's a shift now, and certainly in our engagement with suppliers, and as recently as January the 24th, uh, we had a supplier open day, uh, and any uh, intervention that is seen by the market as fibre-led, uh, there is an appetite to invest, or a sharpened appetite to invest and contribute. Of course, a, a supplier would be taking a commercial view and would be looking at a, a long-term return on an investment, but the gap funding model is there first uh, to provide a solution for those premises that are uh, beyond the scope of commercial deployment. But it's important to us, certainly, that the market invests and, uh, and invests you know, beyond the intervention itself, although we won't be funding that, uh, and, and that they see the network that they design as viable and one that will be maintained and invested in and not withering on the vine. So uh, a combination of a gap funding model and, a, and, a, and an essential uh, contribution from the market will we very much hope maximise the coverage and maintain a network that is open access and gives everybody the choice that they deserve. I suppose what I'm trying to get to is, uh, has the department any experience of delivering a similar project in the past? Well, yes. I yes. Uh, yes, we've uh, run two projects, maybe not on this scale. We ran the Northern Ireland Broadband Improvement Project and the Superfast Rollout Programme. These are investments that are in the region of 16 to 20 million. Um, this is probably one of the bigger, biggest projects we will have rolled out. However, the underlying model and contract and method of oversight uh, are s identical to those models that were used in those previous two contracts. Um, I myself have been involved in overseeing these types of projects across Northern Ireland now for 10 years. So there's experience within the department of running this, and we also have a, a very good team behind us who can uh, ensure that the conditions of the contract um, are met. We, are also, uh, we also have taken this opportunity to gain external experience through uh, people like Nigel um, and also through the appointment of independent external consultants to help us with this procurement process. If I could just add to that in terms of concerns about project governance, I mean, we, we have actually cast our net wide to ensure that we had the appropriate commercial ex experience within the department. And as Trevor says, we've brought in experts. We also have a project advisory board with a range of experts who will provide us with expertise. The Building Digital UK is the body which is a, a, a sort of a, an entity within DCMS which has responsibility for providing assurance on all um, state-led um, broadband projects throughout the UK. We take a lot of assurance from them and there is a member of BDUK on our project board. 
so in terms of governance, yes, it, 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 it is a well-run project building upon internal and external expertise with an advisory board and um, external um, external assurance. Your point on, uh, on learning from elsewhere is well taken. We're, we're not operating in isolation. We engage regularly and actively with our colleagues uh, within the devolved administration. So we're, we're speaking constantly with the team in Scotland who are running the R100 um, uh, project, uh, you know, England and Wales. Uh, and many of the quest, many of the uh, calls start with, you know, how did you approach this, or what is, your, what have your experiences have been? So there's a lot of good sharing of information, which uh, you know helps us uh, informs decisions or recommendations that are made to the advisory panel and taken to the board. Uh, the Carrie, you, add, sorry, there's 100. I mean, those two previous projects, you know, we we actually been 102,000 premises benefited mm -hmm. from the, <clears throat> excuse me, the two the two previous projects for a considerably less project cost, which I think reflects the landscape that we're now dealing with through Project Stratum, and that we're in the hardest to reach and therefore the most costly premises? Well, it depends on how, who, costly to whom, because the, these uh, telecommunications entities, which Nigel refers to, are highly profitable ent entities. You know, these are multinational firms who are making huge profits, and I'll, I'll come on to this point later on, but it, it's who, whose cost to whom is the most important question in this uh, debate? Now, Trevor, in terms of, of the previous experiences you've had, have they been gateway reviewed? There has been gateway reviews done on, uh, both the, on those projects to uh, get through the investment decision. Right. Um, I understand that uh, in terms of cross-border cooperation, ECBAN and others, there was, there was uh, were maybe at an advanced stage in terms of trying to secure funding for a similar project. Is there an audit office report outstanding in relation to some of this work? There is. If you were on the website yesterday, they said they are looking at an audit report, but it's not scheduled to be published till later this year. But is that uh, in relation to the role of the department, the role of arm's length bodies? Who exactly is the audit office reporting to? It's the oversight of those those two projects, NIBIT and SRP. And is the department involved in that? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. And I accept an audit office report, they're, they're regular, and it doesn't mean there's, there's anything at flaw, it's just, but lessons can be learned from it. Uh, in, in terms of, so in, let's come back to cost to the consumer. If I'm uh, receiving broadband through Stratagem and I live in Pomeroy, Will I be paying any more for my broadband than somebody who's living in uh, the, the, the middle of Belfast as a result of, of this? Uh, so we'll take this in two yeah. parts. So the, 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 the potential connection fee is one that uh, Trevor will address. Um, the service provided uh, will be the same for everybody mm. uh, in terms of an open access uh, network may may uh, see a basic service or a gigabit uh, capable service and they'll be priced accordingly, but priced uh, equally across the intervention yeah. area, uh, depending which service or which company um, the consumer decides to avail that through. Uh, and Trevor, on the second point. At present, we can't give any guarantees because that's all part of the underlying project finance model, which will be submitted along with the bids. And that's then when we get an indication of what the pricing for the, the retail pricing will be. As has been mentioned previously behind it, there is wholesale pricing that is then should be uh, available on fair basis to other operators. And those, that, those pricings will be benchmarked uh, against other comparative products. Uh, and again, that's something that BD UK will be overseeing along with Ofcom. So the intention is to ensure that the prices are as equivalent as is possible. But again, we won't know until we see the, uh, the bids being returned to us. But, but, but is it, and I appreciate you can't go into detail in terms of, of the bidding process or the tender process, but is it one of those lines you'll be measuring against in the sense of equality of treatment of rural dwellers against silly dwellers? Because if we're putting £165 million pounds of taxpayers' money into what is a private enterprise, it's, uh, it's, it's, as it says in the, in the consultation, it's state aid, but it's taxpayers' money. So rural dwellers pay tax. They're going to pay tax to put the broadband into their homes, and then they're going to pay a monthly fee 
to the private enterprise to use the broadband. It's a great business model if you're into the telecommunications industry, I have to say. Uh, but surely one of the measures that should be a, uh, a reassurance to rural dwellers is that the department will, ins will ensure, assure them or ensure them ensure that they are not paying more for their broadband than a city dweller, simply because of their location, especially after government giving a significant amount of state aid to private companies. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. It's, um, I mean, it's fair to say if the public funding of 165 million were not there, those 79,000 premises would not be served by the market, unfortunately, because there are, there are no indications. That's how you govern the market. Uh, there are no indications from us that uh, they are in deployment plans currently or in plans. Uh, uh, sorry for interrupting you, Trevor. There was, there was a debate in this assembly before it collapsed three years ago around providing rural broadband. And I said at the time that why would telecommunications businesses invest in rural broadband? They will sit back. They will wait on government giving them the money. And that's exactly what they do every time. The conversation has to change. And this is not directed at you. It's a general, com it's a general comment. The, the, the conversation has to change to putting the pressure back on the private providers who provide this, uh, th this service to our public, or else we change the legislation to make them do so. But sorry for interrupting. If I could just make an yeah. observation on that. I mean, policy in relation to broadband mm. is, is a reserve matter, and mm. we work linked into the wider UK models and contracts and um, within under the auspices of, of, of BD UK. So it's just to make that observation that we are working through a tried and tested format in terms of engagement and rollout of contracts which is actually being deployed UK wide. But it's not a criticism of the department or any of the officials in front of me. It's a criticism of the policy and the way we work. Uh, we, we, uh, the, the narrative that it isn't profitable for these companies to do so, in my opinion, is flawed. They are hugely profitable private enterprises. So, of course, they'll, they'll sit back thus far and say, how long? We'll let the taxpayer invest in that, and then we'll charge the taxpayer for using the service which they've already paid for. So, uh, I'm just trying to change the narrative or challenge the narrative uh, around some of those things. Understood. And of course, we're, yeah, we're operating within yeah. the, the, the legislative boundaries that are available to us, and, and the aspirations of the project are to redress that connectivity gap that yeah. exists uh, between the urban and the rural premises, not just here, but in, in many other countries, and the connectivity gap that uh, exists between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. So, and to do that in a timely manner. Uh, in, in as quickly as possible before uh, the uh, ITT documentation uh, timeline of uh, March 23-24 financial year uh, states that deployment must have uh, been completed at that point. But, uh, sorry, I interrupted the point in terms of the urban rural dweller. There has to be equality for the rural dweller, and I think that's something the Department needs to seriously take under consideration, that there's no further burden placed on the rural dweller because they're a rural dweller. Yes, and take that point, and we, yeah. we will we will take that point away. Um, nobody should be penalised for having access to um, the broadband services that others have access to. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for your, for your presentation so far and your, your answers. Um, I do agree with John. I think it, it, there has to be a quality. It cannot be a situation where people have had state aid to get the broadband to their door and then pay more to connect it just because they're in the countryside. So I appreciate the fact you look into that. Um, there is an ongoing um, tender process in the way, so I don't want to comment on the ins and outs of the application process. But on the other side of that, um, when a contract is awarded, what powers will the department have on whoever is successful in that to ensure that the rollout is completed or begun and completed in as quick a time as possible and that there's no incentive in the company or the shareholders of the company to dwell or um, not get their boots on the ground and get this out as quickly as possible. Do you see where I'm going with that? Indeed, and Trevor will expand on this point, but we, one of the benefits of working with uh, BDUK and the DCMS is that we're working with established uh, templates, existing ITT and contractual templates that exist, and uh, over 30 uh, interventions and projects have been rolled out under these terms, and so there are very tight uh, buttoned up obligations on the suppliers to deliver and perform, and there are milestone payments made every step of the way, or they're not made, or measures are taken to ensure that uh, um, the obligations are fulfilled. Yeah, we can. There is a. The contract itself is highly structured as to when payments can be made, um, and we can only pay for work or equipment that is related to the delivery of this project. 
those also have to be evidenced through uh, invoicing systems um, to the department's satisfaction that uh, that has been expenditure properly incurred. Um, and there's quite a, a list of what is regarded as properly incurred expenditure. Um, what we are looking to do is to ensure expenditure goes directly to the costs of deploying that infrastructure uh, and not uh, what might be the ongoing operating expenditure of that network. Okay, I appreciate the only, Sorry, the only thing I'd add to that at all of that work is quality assured as well by BD UK to, to ensure that the costs are. are uh, viable in, on UK national terms, maybe goes back to the previous point as well, to make sure that Northern Ireland is is on par with what we've been charged and what we've been charged in other parts of the UK. And you'd like to think it's in the interest of the supplier to deploy as quickly as possible so that customers are connected potentially if they wish to connect and then um, start uh, paying for services. You would think so, although it may well be a case that a contractor wins a contract that already has those people signed up, so they might not. Is that not a potential? I mean, what I'm trying to get to appreciate, no money will be will be passed out until work begins. But how do you ensure that whoever is successful begins as quickly as possible and is not their shareholders might not want them to roll that out as quickly as possible? Um, well, the interest is if they, they if they don't roll out the infrastructure and can't demonstrate to us that they've rolled out that infrastructure and we're satisfied that new infrastructure has been deployed. The contractor doesn't get paid. Okay. So the, the money still resides <coughs> with us as the fund holder until we are satisfied that that has been uh, put in place. Appreciate that. How quick, how long can that process go on before you pull the plug and don't let that they continue the tread water? Well, I, well, as, is, as was mentioned, um, we expect a project like this to be delivered over a number of phases. Mm -hmm. Each phase will have a series of milestones. If those milestones are not met, and that's something that they have signed up for, then we start, we start to look at saying, can we get some... Uh, we move into areas of the contract that discuss dispute resolution. Okay. So there's dispute resolution processes in the contract, and you know, we, we've already a number of routes that we can go through on that. Okay. September 2020, then, a contract will be awarded. Um, when do you want to see the contract begin to be ruled out? And in terms of talking about priority for Man South Throne versus Foyle versus East Antrim, if everyone's a priority, no one's a priority. So who triages where the contractor goes first? And is it a situation that one person could be getting it in 2021, someone could be waiting to 2025, or, or are we trying to get this rolled out within two to three years? Um, I, I, as you've painted the scenario, uh, the, we expect the delivery, there'll be a design phase that will have to go through to look at their design, finalise their designs. Um, we expect to start to see infrastructure beginning to do, be deployed six to nine months after contract signing. Um, you're right that the order in which it will be delivered um, will be done in the most economically efficient way. Um, for the better, we will be looking at those plans to see where, where the rollout uh, takes place. But that'll be one of the things that we'll be uh, looking at in the bids. So potentially those most in need and most isolated in the most rural communities will be the ones who will be receiving this last? Under that economic model you've just referred to? Well, when we look and sort of say that most of the 93% um, are in the most rural parts of Northern Ireland, we are hitting the most, uh, want, the most needy areas in the deepest rural areas, according to the figures we have available to us. And, and also two-thirds two of the premises within the intervention area, we're aware, receive speeds of 15 megabits per second or less. So it is a case where broadly everyone, everyone who's going to be targeted is in need. Okay. And how many people, once this is out, will still not be swept up? There'll be a few areas remaining? or will Well, the aim is certainly to ensure that we maximise coverage. <coughs> and so uh, the pressure is on suppliers in many respects uh, under a competitive bid process. So we're down to them to say how many they think they can reach? It's Yeah, in many respects it is. The, the you, currency is our coverage and coverage is our currency, which means the bidder who wins this is very likely, uh, although a range of criteria are evaluated, they'll be very likely uh, reaching um, a, a large number of premises with the best available uh, technology solution. And uh, we want suppliers to invest and contribute so that we maximize that coverage. We're, we're not thinking about uh, 
who's going to be left behind because we're not going to turn our backs on any premises. If we do, because we can't guarantee what the bidders are putting forward, if we do find that there are a number of premises that for one reason or another are unaddressed and they, they may at the moment access a range of speeds based on the network's design, uh, we, will, we will have a strategy to ensure that they're not overlooked, ideally in sync with uh, Project Stratum deployment. We've shared this with uh, local councils, uh, with representatives of NILGA, this aspiration not to leave any premises behind. And so uh, it's right, you, know, you prioritise everybody. Um, it doesn't mean everyone's going to get it at the same time, but there will be a synchronised deployment, very likely, uh, by suppliers. So uh, as many as possible will, will benefit, but it will take time and it'll take until uh, end of financial year 23, 24, until the last uh, uh, premises uh, uh, benefit from access to that infrastructure. If, if I could also just add to that, in the event that there are premises which aren't addressed by this intervention, we are in close contact with DCMSB UK. You'll have heard um, policy statements and aspirations um, sort of made by the, by the Prime Minister and uh, additional funding which will flow from that. We're very much engaged with conversations with DCMS to make sure that Northern Ireland um, you know, it's very, it's very much on the on the radar for that, and that if there's any additional funding for further deployments, that that will come forward. Okay. Yeah, moving on then, um, Gordon Thank and you. Gary, we we have <coughs> more questions. Just for my members, we we are. Really yeah. Okay. Sorry. Thanks very much for your presentation. Um, we've been here before uh, with a number of contracts over, over the years, and some controversy and issues have come up. What assurance can you give us that we not get a repeat of um, the problems that occurred before on, on large contracts? I suppose value for money quality comes to mind in, in relation to those issues. Well, if, if I just start on that yes. and, and then Nigel comes in, just to say how the, how the project is being governed. As I said, we've brought in commercial expertise. We're subject to the, the gateway process. We have uh, an external project advisory board with well-known um, sort of expert figures. We have brought in expert uh, advisors as well. We work closely with DCMS and BD UK, um, and on on that basis, the project has been very tightly governed. Yes, it's, sorry, it's, yeah. big, sorry, it's a big project. You know, 165 million is a huge project. Is there likely to be a number of suppliers involved? Yes, so we, we do have a competitive bid process. Yeah. You'll, of course, understand we can't go into details, but we had, right from the outset, a very encouraging response to pre-market engagement. So into double figures, uh, telecommunications entities that were interested in investing in Northern Ireland, which we saw as a very positive start. We do see this, I certainly do, as a transformational project. I'm proud to have made Northern Ireland my home for the last nine years and would like to see Northern Ireland not only catch up but take over uh, many other areas and uh, connectivity, broadband connectivity is viewed by many as a utility that's likely to increase uh, in years to come. Uh, I have been brought in to work with the team uh, through the Strategic Investment Board, I've been working with the team for 18 months. I've never worked with such a dedicated team, uh, I've never worked on such a project with so many layers of welcome governance, so I can safely say that I think all of the steps and the key milestones that we take to the project board have been thoroughly tested and assured and shared uh, where possible with other devolved administrations. So any recommendation we make is not made in isolation, certainly uh, is made with the right uh, end result in mind, and that's to benefit the citizens of Northern Ireland. But there isn't, I mean, just in, in your question, there isn't going to be, a, I mean, there will be one winning bidder. There won't be a number of yes. contracts. There will be one single contract. And then it could be subcontracted out, of course. It could yeah. be. And that's where, they, you know, the management and the governance is so important. I agree. And uh, is subcontracting civil works, for example, so again, good reason to be working with uh, well-established uh, contracts and templates that have been yeah. part of the uh, the landscape for over 30 interventions. You know that we draw comfort from that, and we've adapted that for Northern Ireland, where we're relevant, uh, but we're not going in cold by by a long chalk. What about the methods that are going to be used? Is ticket as fiber mainly, or are we going to have wireless type systems and so on? Well, we we are required under under Stadia to be. Um, uh, technology neutral, but and we will wait to see what the bids say and what the technical solutions are. 
for what we do know from our, our pre-market engagement with, with the industry. Um, that uh, most of them were saying that fibre is likely to be a considerable part of the solution. It's obviously a very remote, some very remote areas where that would be very difficult and probably not cost effective. There may be areas that we, we have to wait and see what the bids tell us. There may be areas where there's a, a mix of, of, of technology solutions required, but we won't really know that until the bids are received. All of the solutions have to be um, next generation access compliant, so they would have to be providing robust uh, high-speed broadband services. Those um, premises that benefit from access to gigabit capable services and the and the weighting and the scoring uh, will score favorably those suppliers that uh, provide uh, more premises with a, a gigabit capable service will potentially be able to access speeds of over a thousand so you know again the transformational nature of the project uh, if successfully delivered um, will be uh, one of those that we hope we celebrate what is it in the, in the statement of requirement in relation to speeds what are, what are the target so, figures? So, guys, can I we big, yes. find this up yeah, very quickly? Yeah, we, we, just okay. have another briefing. <clears throat> Very clear answer that just yeah. please. Yes, we, we, we have said that the minimum speed we're looking for are services of 30 meg or better, but we are weighting more highly those uh, bidders who can supply services of one gig to premises, and this will be services at a premises level. So we will know. We'll have an indication of what speeds they intend to deliver. Okay. Okay. okay thank you. Thanks, Thanks Gordon. Gordon. Thank you very much. It was uh, really useful. Um, um, we are now moving into to close session, members. And twenty nine. So the, the meeting is now back open to the public. Um, we're moving on to agenda item number seven: matters arising. Um, sure. Before we move on, uh, is there an opportunity for members to discuss what we've just heard in closed session again? Yep. We're going to have to do that at a later date because okay. we're, we're uh, having to vacate this room very quickly. Mm -hmm. So we'll organise to do that, but yes, absolutely. Well, well, in relation to the public session previous to that one, in relation to the <laughs> strategy on the project, project strata, yeah. um, can we ask, I think we have to go through the PAC to ask the Audit Office in relation to the report into previous projects? Could we, could we have an update as to where that report is at? Thank you. Thank you. So, um, sorry. Sorry, any other business? Um, oh, no, no, we're not there yet. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. We may not. <laughs> so, matters arising then, uh, 7.1. On page 74, there is a copy of the correspondence from the Minister to the Minister of State for International Trade. Um, we have discussed this uh, previously. It was a consultation on new target policy proposals. Um, they had launched their consultation. It was a very short consultation, and it obviously was of interest to stakeholders in our business community. The minister, in her response, has highlighted that neither the impact assessment nor the economic analysis was shared as part of the consultation, and outlines the need for a review mechanism to react to unforeseen impacts of the adopted policy. The minister states that the review mechanism is the means by which the NI executive and stakeholders will have meaningful input into the operation of the policy. Policy, sorry. So. Um, we would like to write to the department um, if members are content asking to be kept informed of any response. And we also would like to ask the committee's um, permission to send our um, response to the Lord subcommittee that was here a couple of weeks ago um, um, to the, the Minister Burns. Yeah, as well, the members will call it was around uh, internal UK tariff policy and state aid in the level playing field. If members are content. Okay, so seven point two. Then there is the uh, health minister's or oral statement from earlier in the week regarding coronavirus, and obviously we've discussed um, some actions previously in relation to coronavirus. So if we just want to note that statement, so then moving on to end, um, item number eight, which is an SL one on the employment rights increase of limits order Northern Ireland twenty twenty. There is a clerk's memo at page seventy nine, and the SL one is at page eighty one. Um, this statutory rule is made on an annual basis to fulfil a statutory requirement to adjust limits on statutory awards and payments under the employment rights legislation each year on the 6th of April in line with inflation. So the SR is subject to negative resolution procedure before the Assembly and it's anticipated that the rule will come into operation on the 6th of April. Um, this is the committee's opportunity to consider the policy set out in the SL1 as it's not possible to amend this once the rule has been laid in the Assembly Business Officer. 
office even. So if members are content with the policy implica implications of the proposed. Yeah. Okay, moving on then to number item nine on the agenda correspondence. 9.1, um, there's a memo from the clerk of the finance committee on page 85 with an update on the ongoing issue of the businesses who signed up to the plasma screen and members will um, recall that we have written to the minister on that. The Finance Committee have advised that this issue is now being invested by, investigated by the Trade and Standards Service. Um, the committee, sorry, so we'll be noting that unless there's any actions. Yep. Yeah. 9.2 then, there's correspondence from the um, Northern Ireland Tourism Alliance at page 86, announcing a tourism summit to combat, combat the impact of coronavirus. Um, so we'll note that unless there are members of any actions to suggest. <coughs> Calling the summit for people to gather. Yeah, well. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure they'll follow best. <laughs> exactly. No handshakes and hand sanitizer. 9.3 then. Um, correspondence from the utility regulator at page 88, welcoming Firmus Energy's yep. um, tariff reduction. So we will note that. Um, Great. Um, 9.4 then, correspondence from the Labour Relations Agency, um, including a copy of the agency's corporate plan and outlining its key priorities and challenges over the 2020-21 year. Um, we have asked the Labour Relations Agen agency, agency to come and brief the committee. So um, we are also um, along the same kind of theme, uh, wishing to invite Nick to uh, the Law Centre and CAJ, um, both around you know general issues, but also around Brexit-related issues in terms of employment rights and other rights. So yeah, we chaired we'll that time. We scheduled that in. Yeah. Yep. Um, Nine point five. There's correspondence from Tourism NI um, at page one one two, outlining its priorities and challenges for twenty twenty. Um, and obviously, we've already had a briefing um, on, in relation to that. Yep. 9.6 then, um, there's correspondence from the NI Audit Office in response to our letter regarding Invest NI's approach to, to Right Boss, that um, the Audit Office intends to review these issues as part of its 2019-20 financial audit of Invest NI. So we will note that as well. Great. Um, 9.7, there's correspondence from an individual um, in relation to the Presbyterian Mutual Society um, regarding the role of the previous Enterprise Trade and Investment Committee. Um, and this correspondence has also been copied to the CAC. Um, 9.8, then, there's correspondence from International Synergies um, at page 32 of the table papers outlining their business model and its contribution to the local economy. Chair, I think we both met um, them before we met them at the um, Trade and I event. I do think the letter does justice to what exactly the processes are, this idea of circularity. So waste from one production process can actually be an input to another production process. So if members are content, we'll get them to come in and brief um, the committee. There are so many potential applications for what they're wanting to do, mm -hmm. and I think that's what they're looking for is now to try and upscale. Yeah. Okay, so 9.9, .9, there's correspondence from an individual um, on page 33 of your table papers um, with allegations around staffing and the work of the Brexit department uh, or division within the department. So we are going to forward this correspondence on to the department for a response if um, members are content. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So then moving on to item 10, any other business since you need if you want to. I, I just have one small item of business that's a request to the committee. I recently um, asked for some research um, and information uh, regarding the geographical spread of graduates working within the local uh, labour market. And when, uh, I actually asked them to dig down right from level four right down to level one. It's very interesting data. And based on the fact that we are looking at a skill strategy, um, I think it would be something that I would like this committee to consider, but I would also like um, the officials within the department um, to come into this committee and give us their views on how they are going to tackle um, the disparity that is, is within uh, Northern Ireland. It's pretty stark, um, and it, the disparity is, is, is throughout. So it would be interesting for us to interrogate the data, um, but it would also be interesting to get um, an overview from the department. I know that they too have requested uh, to see the data for they went through um, research and information so they've got the data they're obviously looking at it but as, as a committee 
I think we need to, to look at it further. Yeah, I think um, key priorities for, for us are skills in tackling regional yeah. imbalance, so I think it, it would yeah. be a useful piece of work. Um, so thanks for that. Okay. So moving on then to number 11, which is our next meeting here next. Chair, uh, just one wee thing. Presbyterian Mutual Society letter is dated the 16th of February 2015. That is the one that they sent to the previous committee, yeah, and they were they, they added bringing that. it to our attention. Yeah. Right. Was that, was that an attachment to another letter? There's a piece of March letter as well. Yeah, as well. Mm -hmm. So if you go to page yes. 23. Yeah. It's the most recent one. 23. Page 23. Page 23 is the current one. Um, just being careful not to mention names or addresses. Oh, right, thirty-one, right? And okay. That follows on then into the one that's dated. Um, the bag, yeah. Uh, the, the 2015, which is dated number on page 31. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Exactly, yeah. Which had previously been sent to the Daddy Committee. Yeah. The PAC, that's sorry, Thank PAC. you. Oh, sorry, PAC. Yeah, is that okay, Gordon? Yes, that's grand. Thanks. Thank you. So then, uh, next meeting okay. is okay. next okay. Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. here in this room. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.